Log Talk Radio. Bichiamo apura kanu apura kaitnut neye ojira da medinde ojira po kwezi ra nehem pata akai ojira po akwamu mai maruka etipi mu. That means greetings to all apura kani apura kaitni people, meaning Africans, black people. Today is ojira day. My name is Ojira Po Kwesi Radnehem Pata Akan, Ojira Po of the Akwamu Nation in North America. Yet I say we thank you for tuning in again to our show this week. We're going to be going through a lot of information, a great deal of information. Um, first, we have a couple of announcements, of course. As always, if you are in the chat room, if you want to uh, interact in the chat room, you must log in in order to interact. If you are on the phone lines and you have a question or a comment, just hit the number one so we can see that your hand is raised and we can call on you. Um, coming Mimenda, Saturday, uh, September 13th, we will be in Philadelphia. We'll be back in Philadelphia. We'll be doing a presentation on Nanasom. Apurakani, Apuraikaitni, ancestral religion as it relates to us in America. So we're going to have that presentation um, at 1 p.m. Philadelphia um, at the Our Black Comeback Center on 25th in York. Go to the website, our website, ojirapo.com, O-D-W-I-R-A-F is in free, O.com. We have a event flyer for that event, and all the detailed information is there. Of course, it's a free event. All of our events are free. We do not charge um, attendees to our events and admissions fee. We will be giving away a free copy of one of our soft cover books to everyone who attends the event. Uh, this is something that we've been doing for over the past year. We've given, over, given away over 300 copies, free copies, of our soft cover books at these events. So um, to date, uh, of course, we'll be doing that again this, this, this weekend. Uh, to date, we have 10 of our books in soft cover in addition to uh, the e-book e version. So we have 15 books all together. The e-book versions are available. All of them are free download. Out of those 15, 10 of them we all the ebook versions, we have 10 of them in soft cover as well. And so, and we sell those. So the free are on the site. You can download at any time. Um, and then you can, of course, you can order the soft cover versions. One of the soft cover versions of one of the books we will be giving away for free at the event. Uh, the soft cover versions of our books only range between $8 and $11, and we also have so you can go to the site and order one or more of those to support our work. And we also have a program for those who would like to become distributors if in, a, in an entrepreneurial fashion. You purchase the books from us at a wholesale price, and then you can sell them independently as an entrepreneur to generate additional income for yourself, as well as informing our community with accurate information. So all of that information is on the site. Information about the distributor program, the Noquadepo distributor information document is on the on the publications page of our website, as well as a video where we go into detail about that process. In addition to, of course, uh, links to all of the, the books. Of course, we also have 60 plus articles. We have 48 videos, and out of the archives, we have over 30 broadcasts of archives of blog talk of our blog talk shows. We have a show on Joada Mondays, Akan Po Nana Som, Ancient, Authentic, Akan, Ancestral Religion, which is every Joada, every Monday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we have, today, of course, we have Ojida, which is every Benada, Abenada, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then we have every Awukuda or Akuada Wednesday, Egua, which means marketplace, where we showcase a business, product, or service have guests on who talk about their product or service who 
um, serve the Apurakani Apurakani community and also share our ancestral values. So we have those three shows um, weekly, and we also have archives, over 30 shows archived you can download at any time. Most of the shows range between two and three hours. Um, uh, programming note next week, um, and we've been doing our weekly shows since, well, Ojira and Egua on Binada and Awukuda, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, since uh, the end of May. We added the Akanto Nanasong show on Monday, Joada, a couple of weeks ago. So that's weekly as well. Um, so we've been doing those since uh, May. This next week, because it's the beginning of our Ojira, Obrajira, Nanonom Som, or our Akwamu New Year, we have a seven-day New Year celebration. It's, this year is from September 16th through September 22nd. Through that seven-day period, we will not have any broadcast. So therefore, next Joada next Monday is the 15th. We will have Akanfo Nanasom show on that day. But Tuesday and Wednesday of next week, we will not be broadcasting. So that's the 16th and the 17th. We will, we will not be broadcasting on those two days because of the um, – uh, re religious holiday. And the following Monday is the 22nd. On the 22nd, we will not be broadcasting on that day as well. We will start back on the 23rd. So uh, today, tomorrow, and then Monday the 15th. Monday the 15th will be the last broadcast, and from September 16th through the 22nd, there will be no broadcast, and then beginning again back on the 23rd, We'll start the broadcast again. So that's just a programming note. And always check the website to, you know, get updates with regard to that information. Okay, so we're going to put a couple of links up in the chat room. Um, one of them is the Akra Dean Bosom page, where we talk about the Abosom of the seven days of the week. One of them is the Okra Okra Complex page. Our book called the Okra, Okra Complex, The Soul of Our Kanfo, which is the same as the Ka and Kaeda and Ancient Kemet. And we're also going to have, and if you go to just the regular website, links to the articles, and I'll put this up there as well. You can go to the Nshui Shui Mu page where all of our articles are linked. And when we talk about or mention different articles, we you'll be able to go directly to them. So, all right. I just wanted to check to make sure. And if um, if there's a situation, anybody in the chat room, um, send us a message right quick. Let us know you can hear clearly. Um, and again, for those who are who just joined in, um, if you're a guest in the chat room, if you want to interact, you have to log in. So if you don't have a login. Um, name, you can create one quickly, username, and you can interact that way. For those who are in the chat who are logged in, send us a message right quick just so we can make sure you can hear clearly, and then we're going to get started. And for, again, for the new people on the phone who just joined in, if you have a question or a comment, just hit the number one, and then we can see that your hand is raised and we can um, call on you. All right. The title of the show, Abosom Pem, Apurakani, Apuraikani, or African Ancestral Polytheism. And this is an important topic we need to get into. Um, and just one more second. The couple of people who are logged in who are not guests, somebody send a, a quick message. Just let us know that you can hear clearly um, through the live stream. In the chat room, just send a quick message. All right. So this is a very – okay, may I say. So this is a very important topic because there's a great deal of misinformation regarding the nature of our Apurakani, Apuraikani, or African ancestral religion, of course, stems from the misinformation deliberately 
propagated by the Achiwadjepo, the spirits of disorder, the whites and their offspring. Of course, their goal is to turn us away from our own ancestral religion because that's the only means by which they have determined that they can control the minds and therefore the behavior of our people. As we talked about yesterday in, in previous shows, over thousands of years of the whites and their offspring invading ancient Afurakani, Afuraikaitni, or African civilizations and being uh, destroyed by us militarily, they began to infiltrate into the cultures later after losing military battles and so forth, seeking ways to ally with those who were disgruntled within society, trying to build coalitions with those individuals, and then waging war against the ruling structure or the ruling class in that fashion. That had been going on for thousands of years because typically the whites and their offspring were not powerful enough to overtake our civilizations militarily. After thousands of years of not being successful in their endeavors, they began to realize that the only way that they could control Burakani Afurakaitni people if they allied with disgruntled elements within the society who were willing, sometimes criminal elements within the Afurakani Afurakaitni society, but also disgruntled elements, if they could ally with them, make a deal with them, and as a coalition they wage war against the ruling class and take over a certain region for a certain period, typically what would happen is they would only be in control for a short while before we regrouped and destroyed their coalition and restored order to society. After having this happen for thousands of years, the whites and their offspring realized that the only way that they felt they could control an Afurakani, Afurakani population, if they were um, lucky, quote-unquote, enough to, through a coalition, take over a certain region and hold on to it for, for longer than they were able to do in the past, is if they corrupted the religion. They understood that the only thing that we adhere to is divine order, which in ancient Kemet, the term set chair means plan, divine plan, arrangement, and so forth. Amenet, amen, or the great mother and the great father, supreme being, amenet, amen, set chair would be the great divine order. In our Khan culture, the term nshesh means arrangement or order. It's the same term as Sesher in Kemet is Nshesher in Akan. Nyamewa, Nyame, Nshesher is the great mother and the great father's divine arrangement or order. The White Canal Spring recognized through observation and through infiltration that the only thing that we adhere to, that we will, you know, submit to, if you want to use those terms, is divine order. So they recognize that if they could corrupt the religion, that they will be able to corrupt the minds of misguided individuals within the society. And maybe through that process, they would finally be able to control the minds of the people, the population, and hold on to a region that they were able to take through a, you know, a united uh, military expedition and hold on to it longer. So they began that process of corrupting the religion. It took them thousands of years. It didn't happen overnight. It wasn't like one night they just changed the religion around and all of a sudden everybody started practicing the new fake religion. It took them literally thousands of years, going back to, in a, in a major way, when the Greeks invaded and took over um, in the northern part of Kemet and had allies in the northern part of Kemet who were against the ruling class and so forth, of course the first thing they would do is they began to imitate the people of ancient Kemet. They would dress like us. They would take on names like us. They would build temples and have direct temples to be built, um, creating sculptures and deities and engaging in rituals and burials and everything in imitation of us. They began to make statues of the different divinities, they would change the names slightly, corrupt them into Greek versions, so Osar, Oset, and Heru becomes Osiris or Osiris, Aset or Isis, and Horus or Horus 
Um, they would change the names of different divinities. Then they would begin to create white versions of these ancient divinities in sculpture. Now, of course, when we have statues of the gods and goddesses, the divinities, of course, they're black. They represent who they look like when they take up residence spiritually and possess during ritual practice or manifest to us in the human sphere spiritually. Of course, they manifest with black features because that's the original and prototype for a human being and the only prototype, of course. So the whites in our frame will start making white, perverse images of these cor corruptions. Now, of course, the deities would never take up residence and communicate with anybody, any of the whites in our spring, ever, through these white sculptures. They were just making sculptures, pretending like they're deities, putting, placing them in temples, eventually directing people um, through royal decrees to place these white images, for example, in the Rosetta Stone, so-called Rosetta Stone, the so-called Ptolemy ruler directing people to place images of himself in all of the temples in ancient Kemet to be worshipped alongside of the actual sculptors of the divinity, the actual divinity. So the White Narrow Spring started that process. They also started the process of, you know, enshrining their homosexual um, boyfriends and everything else. And we're going to get into that as well. Um, so they started that process even during the time of the Greek occupation and then later the Romans. Then after the Romans were overtaken by the Arabs and ancient Kemet, these processes continued. They, they had a number of council meetings, not just the Council of Nicaea or Ephesus, but council meetings going through for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, um, perverting the doctrine, taking things out of our ancestral religious doctrine, manufacturing perverted fragments of the doctrine and so forth, moving forward like that. So it took them literally thousands of years before, finally, large numbers of some of our people began to embrace that nonsense. But even when those of our people began to embrace that nonsense, most of our people did not embrace that nonsense. So that's how it began. That's how the corruption began. They recognized that if they can control the images of the divinities and the philosophy that's associated with the divinities and get us to reject the divinities, the deities, the divine spirit forces in nature, then the only thing that we would have left to listen to as far as they were concerned that they hoped was them. If they could create an idea eventually after first corrupting the images of the divinities but then outlawing any worship of divinity, period, closing temples in Kemet like the Romans did and putting forth the notion that none of those deities ever really existed there's only one deity, and the whites are the representative of that one deity. That was purely a political, criminal move designed to get us to reject our communication with the divine forces in nature, because if we listened to them, we would only adhere to divine order. And if we adhere to divine order, we would naturally embrace divine law, which is the expansive pole of order, and divine hate which is the contractor pole of order. And we adhere, when we adhere to divine order and the embodiments of order, which is what the deities are, the spirits that animate creation are the embodiments of order and creation. When we adhere to order and these agents of divine order, we would naturally be drawn to exterminate the white and their offspring, not to embrace them, but to kill them, to massacre them, to eradicate them totally because that's divine order. It was then just as it is right now at this moment. So they had to keep us away from embracing order because the deities, which are embodiments of divine order, would direct us to exterminate the spirits of this order, just like the immune system in your body enforces order in your body. When cancerous cells develop, become disfigured, and seek to destroy and kill all the other cells and consume them and destroy the entire body, the immune system, lymphatic system moves immediately to kill those disordered cells and restore order to the body. That's natural. That's divine order. 
and those of us who are immune system cells, lymphatic system cells, and so forth, operate in the same fashion. We seek to destroy the spirits of disorder. The whites and their offspring incarnate as spirits of disorder. All of them who exist, all of them who have ever existed, all of them who ever will exist until they become extinct, until we make them extinct. That means white Europeans, white Americans, white Hindus, white Arabs, white Hispanics, white Latinos, white Asians, white pseudo-Native Americans who are really not Native at all and just Asians, all non-black, non-Apurakani, non-Apuraikaitani people are the whites and their offspring. They are spirits that incarnate as spirits of disorder. And there's no returning to order for these entities, just like there's no returning to order for the cancerous cell. Once it becomes disfigured and then sick, seeks to consume and destroy the other cells, the divine response encoded within the immune system that was created by the supreme being and the lymphatic system is to isolate and destroy these cells, not to, quote-unquote, repair them, but to eradicate them. Just as it is in the body, so it is in the divine body of black humanity. And the whites and their offspring are nothing more than cancerous cells in the body of Apurakani, Apuraikaitani, African black humanity who have metastasized and have spread unchecked to a certain extent. And we need to check that spread and eliminate that spread. So they recognize the reality. When we embrace divine order, that means their destruction, their divine destruction, and nothing will stop us from, from uh, moving in that direction. So they had to corrupt the religion. First, they began to corrupt images of the divinity. They did that for a while, and we see that with the corruptions of the divinities going from black divinities to white Greek statues and so forth and white Greek paintings and then later white Roman um, images of deities and white Roman paintings and even up into the Levant and the Near East and in India and so forth, wherever the whites and their offspring invaded they began to change the images of the divinities from black to images of their perverse selves. But later on, they went further and said, well, no, we have to go further because this is not effective enough, especially in the, the Western Eurasian. The Western Eurasian decided it wasn't effective enough. And these are the ones who were invading North Afrika, Afrika, and later different parts of the continent. They said it wasn't enough for us to, or effective enough, just to change the images from black to white. The people are not falling for this because they still have the same philosophy. Let us put forward the notion that there are no divinities at all, except for one, a one male divinity, and that divinity is a white male, or it's an invisible divinity that we are the representatives of. And if we can push at that notion, then we can control the population. Because if they attack us and they embrace that philosophy, that means they're attacking the representatives of the one invisible male white divinity, and therefore the people won't want to attack the representatives of the divinity, so therefore we will be able to maintain control. It took them hundreds of years to promote that notion. They've been trying to promote it for over a 1,000 years on the continent, of course, with Islam, Judaism, Christianity, it only began to take root a few hundred years ago, mainly a couple of hundred years ago, in certain portions of uh, North and East Afrika, Afrika, certain ruling classes took on and accepted certain aspects of so-called Islam. The vast majority of those populations, however, didn't embrace the culture until hundreds of years later. So when you see books about history, and they take a wide paintbrush and paint across the entire northern part of the continent and say this was all part of the Islamic empire, you would have rulers who would take on an Islamic name. They would take on certain practices so that they could engage in trade with those from the east, whether it was blacks from the east or, or white Arabs from the east, but their population 
their nations, the people who made up those nations, they didn't embrace that nonsense. And it's the same today. You'll find people in different parts of West, Central, South Apuraikai, where certain leaders will have embraced Christianity. Certain um, chiefs, chieftainesses, um, kings, queen mothers, they will take on Christianity in name and so forth. But when it's time for them to engage in real ritual, they still pour libation to their ancestresses and ancestors. They still engage in naming processes. They still invoke the deities. They still do the basic things that they continue to do. And on the surface, they've embraced, quote-unquote, Christianity, they believe, for political purposes. And although that's still a mistake, it's still self-destructive, it's the seeds of, of destruction when you embrace nonsense. It's no different than saying, I'm just going to smoke a little bit of crack, but outside of that, I'm going to eat my, the normal food that I normally eat on a regular basis. If you decide to open yourself up to poison, even though it's a small amount of poison, that small amount, once it gets in the system, can cause uh, wreak havoc and cause destruction. So even though you have people who politically would take on these titles, the vast majority of the population were not involved in the process. So when we talk about true story, we need to do our own true story. You can't listen to white Arabs talking about the spread of Islam. You can't listen to white Europeans talking about the spread of Christianity. You can't talk, listen to white Hindus uh, talking about the spread of Hinduism or Vedanta and so forth. We need to find out from our own people what the real true story is. And what we will find is the vast majority of the people over hundreds of years on the continent and outside never embraced the nonsense. Nonsense. It was a ruling class, typically, and they did that foolishly to engage in trade and commerce and other interactions, forms of exchange with our enemies, and that led to our downfall. So this is the process whereby they began to, you know, push this foolish notion of monotheism. We go into detail about the names and functions of different divinities and so forth in ancient Kemet in the Kukutuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction. Uh, but we want to lay the foundation, true historically and politically, why the White Narrow Spring moved in that direction. As our Nanano Nsumampo of Akwamumai, Amarukai Tifimu, our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors in the Akwamu Nation of North America have taught us, they will teach us and remind us, of course, that a hostage is one who is um, is defined as one who is not allowed to communicate with his or her loved one. When you put forward a doctrine, a foolish doctrine, a dogma that says that it is criminal um, against divine order to communicate with the deceased or it's against divine order to believe, quote, unquote, or recognize the various different gods and goddesses, if you teach that's an abomination or you teach necromancy or communication or divination with the deceased is an abomination, then what they're doing is holding us hostage, not allowing us, if we're foolish enough to embrace that, to communicate with our loved one. So this is the reason the White Snarl Spring began to move in that direction over 2,000 years ago to get us in the position where the only thing that we will listen to is their false doctrine and listen to them because they recognize if we listen to our own people, then we will kill them. We will exterminate them and restore balance to our existence, to our nations, our communities, and so forth. So they had to move in that direction because they are spirits of disorder. So that's the political um, basis for that. Now, what happens is many of our people who began to re-embrace ancestral culture, ancestral religion, and so forth. They began to study, for example, texts from ancient Kemet, try to learn something about the culture of ancient Kemet and Kanit, Nubia. They'll also embrace traditions like the Yoruba tradition, Akan, Igbo, Vodun, different traditions. However, through their study, whether stuttering, studying the literature or interacting with individuals who are either from the continent or from the Western Hemisphere who are already involved in the culture or maybe have grown up in the culture, 
or are descended from a, a line of, you know, a lineage of people, a blood circle of people who are in the culture, if they have been infected, which they have been, then they teach a perversion of the culture that comes from the whites in their offspring that's a, a reflection of the Islamic, Christian, Judaic, and even in the East, Hindu and Buddhist corruptions of our tradition that go back hundreds of years. And some of our people have carried those corruptions into the present day. When we don't understand that, we go to a person on the continent, they appear to be a traditional, they speak their traditional language, they wear traditional dress, eat traditional food, engage in traditional ritual, pray, of course, and chant in the traditional language and make sacrifices and so forth and do divination. It looks all traditional. However, they're descended from people hundreds of years ago who had embraced either embraced Islam or some elements of Islam or embraced Christianity or some elements of Christianity, embraced Judaism, so-called Hebrewism, or some elements of that nonsense. And they brought those infections intergenerationally into the culture and they're carried to the present day. The true story of our people is distorted by these individuals. They go from having an oral true story about our actual origins in Asuraka, Afraikai, when they come in contact with the Arabs, all of a sudden they change their true story and start trying to trace their lineage back to the fictional cartoon character named Muhammad, who never existed, or to the fictional cartoon character named Bilal, who never existed, or to Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, who never existed. You have people doing that with the Islamic infection, people with the Christian, Judaic infection. They'll try to trace their blood circle back to Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jesus, all of these fictional cartoon characters. You will have black people in the East trying to connect themselves to Buddha who never existed as well. That's just as idiotic as a European coming to black people in America teaching us for the first time about Chris Pringle, Santa Claus, and the elves in the North Pole, and then Negroes turning around and beginning to trace their ancestry back to Chris Kringle, Santa Claus, and the, and the elves at the North Pole. And so I was saying, well, actually, my great-great-great-grandfather, he's directly descended from the elves. And the or that's, that's just nonsense. And that's exactly how idiotic and foolish our people are when they try to trace themselves back to biblical characters who never existed. So in the Kuku Tuntun, the ancestral jurisdiction, we go into detail to prove Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, Aaron, Jesus, Yeshua ben Pandera, Buddha, Brahman, Yahweh, Allah, all of these characters are absolutely fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any race whatsoever and in any form whatsoever, and we prove that conclusively. So just like some of our people, we could see how foolish it would be to trace our, you know, lineage back to Santa Claus, even though you have some foolish Negroes who identify themselves as Morris who say Santa Claus was black, more idiocy. Um, but for normal people, sensible people, it would make no sense at all for us to do that. It's exactly what people on the continent have done and continue to do to this day. They'll try to trace their lineage to fictional, biblical, Quranic, Talmudic characters. So that's been going on. And some of our people come in contact with these individuals they get a corrupt, infected Yoruba culture, a corrupt, infected Akan culture, a corrupt, infected Vodun culture with white mermaids and images of Krishna and nonsense like that. Um, and they try to tie themselves back to that perverse culture, which they are not connected to at all. Um, they get a, a corrupt, infected Dogon culture, an inf uh, 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 infected or corrupt um, Guramanch culture, and so forth are just across the board. They think that they've embraced the real culture. Now they come back and begin, sometimes they get initiated as priests, priestesses, become, you know, enthroned as kings and queen mothers and so forth, and now they're nothing more than priests and priestesses of a false doctrine. Kings and queen mothers of a corrupt culture. And then they bring that back to people in the United States, and they appear to be, you know, authorities, Foolishly, some of our people believe that, and then those people get connected with such individuals and 
the misinformation just, you know, is perpetuated. Some of the people engaged in shrine work, they evoke discarnate spirits who mislabel themselves and fraudulently promote themselves as Orisha, Abosom, Bodu, and so forth. And they give out misinformation. Some of the same criminals who allied with the white Arabs when they were alive, these criminals, when they died, they're still hanging around corrupt, disordered spirits. And when people pour libation and they're not involved in real culture, not connected to their own ancestresses and ancestors harmoniously, these criminal spirits will come forward and try to influence them. And if we're not knowledgeable or, you know, aware, we will assume that these discarnate spirits, we won't even check them. We won't even scrutinize them. Whatever they say, we just go along with it. That's not part of our culture. We scrutinize what any disembodied entity communicates to us. If it's an ancestor, ancestress, or divinity, we measure what they say against the standard of divine order because we have a crowd embedded within our spirit, a soul of divine consciousness that's rooted in order. If any spirit that comes forward says anything that's out of harmony with that divine order, then we reject them because we know they're not real cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. We know they're not real divinity. So, but when we don't know any better, what any, any spirit that comes forward and says anything, whether it's through possession, possesses somebody at a ritual, ritual song, ritual dance, or through divination, and they say, oh, the spirit said this, the spirit said that. Or if you, you're a little bit clairvoyant, a little bit clairaudient, and you can see a spirit walking around, or you can feel one moving through the house, or you can hear a spirit communicating with you, and you don't scrutinize and measure what they say, and urge you to do against the standard of divine order, you just, because you've been brainwashed, you think, well, I'm just going to accept whatever they say because it seems mystical and deep. Those criminals who allied themselves with the white Arabs during their previous lifetimes still ally themselves with criminality. They have a desire to corrupt. They're like viruses. They're like cancerous cells, even in the spirit realm. They only seek to consume and destroy so, therefore, they will lie just like they lied when they were on earth. They'll lie and say, oh, well, you know, black people don't come from Africa. They come from Asia. Black people come from the land of move. Black people are, come from, you know, um, another star system. All of the idiotic nonsense that we find our people teaching, you will find that some of them who are a little bit clairvoyant, clairaudient, some are getting it from individuals who have taught them initiated them or instructed them, some of them who are a little bit receptive are getting this misinformation from these corrupt criminals who are discarnate spirits, wayward, earthbound, walking around, misinforming people on a regular basis. Very simple. So all you have to do, of course, is understand who you are, connect with your own insomnia, and we're going to get into that. So we're just showing how this information passed on, you know, um, from one kind, one group to another. It's been intergenerational, from the white in our spring to the infected black people. Those infected black people continue intergeneration, intergenerationally to pass on this misinformation through a oral tradition, a corrupted oral tradition, and even spiritually, criminals who used to be Muslims. They were criminals waging war against our people with the white Arabs, engaged in dissexuality, everything else. And when they die, they're still trying to urge people to be homo because they embrace that perverse white culture when they're alive. They're still trying to urge people to do that now. They're trying to urge people to ally with the whites in their offspring and engage in self-destructive behavior. They try to urge people, and you feel urges, to smoke marijuana, drink alcohol, do drugs, and so forth, and all of the foolish, idiotic rationalizations for smoking marijuana, trying to make it deep and spiritual and all this other nonsense coming from the whites and their offspring, as well as discarnate criminal spirits who are still trying to urge us to engage in nonsense. And then we repeat the nonsense. So this is how it comes about. Some of our people who are sincere, when we try to embrace culture, this is what we are confronted with. We don't know any better, typically. 
So we look for, you know, somebody who has published, studied some information or traveled, or somebody who has embraced a culture to a certain extent, learned the language, learned ritual practices, maybe got initiated into a priest or priestesshood and so forth, or people who have just been doing a great deal of work um, intellectually, studying, writing, teaching, and so forth. They're studying from the whites and their offspring. They're studying from Asians, studying from all kinds of nonsense, and it affects the culture. So now you have a, a vast majority of people who are teaching about ancestral religion. They're teaching an infected culture. So they come forward and teach that the ancient people of Kemet were actually monotheists. They believe monotheism is the highest level of development. In reality, as we have shown and alluded to, monotheism is the creation of the inferior mind of the Caucasian. The whites and their offspring are incapable of communicating with the great father and the great mother, the supreme being. They're incapable of communicating with the Abosom, the Orisha, Vodou, and so forth. Of course, they can't communicate with the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of Afraka, Afraka. They are angry about that reality. They would like to control us. They can't control us. So, of course, as we said, the only way they could, could control us is to make us not listen to the supreme being, the divinities, the ancestors, and the ancestors. And even if they communicate with us, our insamanto, our ancestors and ancestors, the divinities, even if they make a communication, if we've been brainwashed enough, the whites and their offspring cannot stop the Abosom, the Orishas, the Vodou from communicating with us. They can't stop our ancestresses and ancestors from communicating with us, and they know that. So their key was, well, if we can't stop them from communicating, all we have to do is poison the mind of the Afurakani, Afuraikaidi person to say, if I receive a communication from any spirit that's not the fictional character Jesus or the fictional character Allah, the fictional character Yahweh, then that spirit that's communicating with me is an evil spirit. I'm just going to ignore whatever they say and whatever they tell me to do. I'm going to do the opposite. So our ancestresses and ancestors will communicate with us or show themselves to us. Yeah, both of them will communicate, possess, show themselves to us. And our first response is, yes, I just saw that entity. Yes, I saw that ancestral spirit. Yes, I felt and heard what this divinity just told me. But the white neural spring told me if any spirit communicates with me, that must be the devil, so I shouldn't listen to them and I should disobey them and never obey them. So that way they felt they could effectively neutralize the influence of the divinity because they can't stop them from communicating with us. And that's very key. So some of our people began to study ancient Kemet. They started saying, oh, monotheism is, is the key. Our people were actually, you know, monotheists. We were the first monotheists. They bought into the foolish idea that polytheism is inferior, monotheism is superior. They're embarrassed about polytheism because they're brainwashed Negroes, brainwashed by the whites and their offspring. They hate their own culture now, so they would like to change the actual culture and morph it into monotheism to make themselves feel better about their own ancestral culture. So they will walk around teaching people foolishly that we taught monotheism. That has never been true. So it's time for people who actually embrace real culture to teach real culture and take the teaching of real culture out of the hands of brainwashed intellectuals, misguided individuals who are sneaking around in metaphysical bookstores and, on, and websites, taking in all of that misinformation, blackening it up, and then presenting it to the community as, oh, this is the culture of ancient Kemet. They don't want to tell the truth that they hate our ancestral culture. They're embarrassed by our ancestral culture because they're brainwashed. They think our ancestral culture is ignorant and primitive because they have been brainwashed. But they don't want to say that to people. Yet they want to claim African, quote-unquote, spirituality. So the way they can do that is to embrace white pseudo-mysticism, white pseudo-esotericism, which they worship because they're brainwashed, meaning they still worship the whites and their offspring, even though they will not admit it. Take that occult nonsense, 
blacken it up, and then refashion it as ancient ancestral culture and religion from ancient Kemet and from our ancient cultures. We're trying to say the substratum of all of the traditional African cultures is this pseudo-occult nonsense that they get from the whites and their offspring, pseudo-New Age spirituality and so forth. So we have to get back to reality. So all you have to do, many of these people, what they won't do is they won't direct people to actually, number one, embrace ancestral religion. Even the word religion has been poisoned by the whites and their offspring, and these people are scared to use the word religion. They say, oh, no, 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 I'm not, I don't practice religion. I'm in spirituality. The people of ancient Kemet didn't practice religion. That's idiotic. Of course they practice religion. There are gods and goddesses all over the temples of ancient Kemet. They were engaged in ritual religious practices. All Afurakani, Afuraikaiti cultures are rooted in religion. There's a difference between fake religion and real religion. The only real religion is Afurakani, Afuraikani, or African ancestral religion, no matter what form it takes, whether it's ancient, the form of ancient Kemet and Kanit, which is expressed today through the Yoruba, Akan, Ebe, Ibo, Goromach, Maasai, and the various cultures, Bakongo, and so forth. It doesn't matter which culture it comes from. It's all fundamentally the same process. We have different expressions of the same process, but it's all based on harmonizing our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. So whether it's those various expressions on the continent and those expressions that we brought into the Western Hemisphere and continue to practice naturally, including hoodoo in in the United States, uh, voodoo in, you know, in the Caribbean and South America, um, Candomblé and um, various different traditions that we continue to practice. These are all the same traditions. Real religion and spirituality is exactly the same. They are identical. Fake religion is not identical with with real religion or spirituality. The whites and offspring have us believe that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hebrewism, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and so forth are religions or forms of spirituality, and they are not. They are corruptions of fragments of our culture, deliberate corruption. They are pseudo-religions and pseudo-spirituality. And the same is true of the pseudo-esoteric, quote-unquote, sciences, which are not sciences at all. And, of course, you can include atheism, that nonsense, in that pseudo-religious group, because, of course, atheism is just a pseudo-belief system. So um, our people begin to embrace these things because they feel inferior. They don't want to admit they feel inferior, but they do, and that's why they embrace this nonsense. It also bespeaks the reality that they're not really connected to these Ntoru, Ntoru, to these divinities of ancient Kemet or the Orisha or Abosom or Vodou and so forth that they claim to be because if they were, they would not be spouting this nonsense. So it's a betrayal of the fact that they're not really engaged in real religious practice. So first we can look at some texts of ancient Kemet And then, of course, we can look at the actual culture um, that's still alive, that we still practice and easily demonstrate, of course, that we're not monotheistic and the the idiocy of monotheism. Of course, we have the Ma'al Keru webcast called um, The Idiocy of Monotheism, which you can listen to. It's on the web web page. So first, let's look at the obvious. For example, we have an article called Note on the Origin of the Name Onyame in Ancient Kanit and Kemet. And all we're doing here is we're showing that Onyame, or Onyame, the great father in ancient in our Khan culture, and Onyame Wa, the great mother in our Khan culture, that is a variation of the name Amen. So Amen in ancient Kemet, one of his titles is Ariyame and Ariyame, the symbol of the I, Ari, is prefixed to the name Amen. Of course, he's the one who sees all. Ari, Amen, the 
term for I, Adi, in ancient Kemet, and then you also have the term for I and Akan, Ani, exact same term, because, of course, the languages are the same because the Akan people, as well as the Yoruba Ebe and various others, migrated from the Hapi Valley thousands of years ago, migrated to the western part of the continent, and reestablished culture. So our languages, our ritual practices, were the same people who just migrated to different areas. No different than pe black people migrating from Mississippi to Chicago or, you know, Alabama to New York. We migrated from ancient Kanid and Kemet to West, Central, and South Afuraka, Abraikai, reestablished civilization after the fall of our civilizations in the East. And then hundreds of years later, some of our people who had migrated West, Central, and portions of South were taken from those areas and brought to the Western Hemisphere. This is why genetically... We are connected to not only the people of West Central and South Afrika, Afrika, but we have the same genetic y haplogroup. group, many of us, over 50 to 75 percent of us, as that of Ramesu III and Tutankhamen. Those genetic studies have been done, of course, we mentioned that in the other webcast. And the language is the same. The deities, the names of deities are the same. Their ritual colors, their functions in creation, as well as the um, ritual practices prayers, and so forth. So, um, and this is why the language is the same. So, Adi means I and Kemet. Ani means I and Akan. Aro means mouth and Kemet. Ano means mouth and Akan. Ka means to speak in Kemet. Ka means to speak in Akan. We, we can just, there are thousands of words that are identical, and then even the names of deities and their specific functions are identical as well. So, Ariyame a title of Ame and Kemet. This is why we call the Supreme Being, the Great Father, Aniyame, or Onyame, Nyame, and Akan. Of course, Amenet, Ariyamenet, Amenat becomes Onyame Wa in Akan culture and so forth. So we have an article dealing with them. Um, note on the origin of the name Nyame in ancient Kanid and Kemet. The first thing you see on the article, which is key, is an actual release an image from the temple of Apet, Asut in ancient Kemet. It's an image of Amenet and Amen, which is Inyamewa and Inyame in Akan. Amenet and Amen, the great father and the great mother, sitting together side by side. Already, monotheism is destroyed just by that image. And then we have other, another image of them as well. And you can find numerous images of them. We have another image of them at the end of the article. They're standing up, they're standing together, and you see Amenet and Amen, male and female, husband and wife, the great father, the great mother, standing together. That destroys monotheism immediately because you already have two divinities. But let's go to the earliest text, the earliest religious text in existence so far on earth the earliest religious compositions that have been unearthed in the world to date are the Meru texts of the so-called pyramid texts. And if you look at the pyramid texts, which go back to the 5th and 6th, quote-unquote, dynasty, earliest religious compositions, there are no com compositions, religious compositions anywhere on earth that have been unearthed to date released to date, of course, you know the crackers have earlier, you know, texts and everything that they found of ours that are much earlier, but they don't want to release those because it just destroys everything that they've been trying to build with regard to this misinformation. But even with the text, the pyramid text, the Meru text, the earliest religious compositions that have been released on earth to date, you will find in the earliest text, Amen and Amenet together, side by side. So you'll have, for example, um, in utterance uh, 301 of the Pyramid of Unas, one of the texts says you have your bread, loaf, um, talking about an offering, amen with amenet, you pair of the deities who join the deities with their shadows, with their spirit forms. Amen and amenet, that they're being invoked together, side by side, calling them a pair of divinities. 
and talks about how you pair the deities with their shadows, with their specific spirit form. So first, the great father and great mother are spoken of, number one, not as one unit, meaning a fused entity that that's just one, but they're separate, but they work together, of course, as a unit. But they are male and female divinity that work together, two halves of a divine whole, immediately, right there. Then they talk about the other divinities, plural, ntoru, ntoru to divinities, plural, in the text. That destroys the notion of monotheism. We already have the image that you can actually look at of Amen and Amenet sitting together. Then you have and numerous images. Then, of course, you have the oldest religious text in existence talking about Amen and Amenet from the beginning. So, again, two things. That destroys the whole notion of monotheism, but the second part is they're together from the beginning. That means that there wasn't a time when there was just Amen, the great father, and no mother. She's not his daughter or any nonsense like that. There was never a time when there was just Amenet, the great mother, and Amen being her son. That's more foolishness as well. So some of our people who have embraced white, patriarchal, dissexual, homosexual teaching, they believe that there was one male God. Some of us have grafted that foolish notion onto ancient commands, so they only speak of Amen and Amen, Ra, but they don't speak of Amenet or Amenet, Ra'et, which is one of her titles, actually. Then on the flip side, some of our people have embraced the matriarchal, feminist, white, dissexual nonsense of originally there was only a mother goddess and there was no male god. Pure foolishness. And this text, of course, shows that. And, of course, the images of Amen and Amenet show that clearly. And then, of course, when you embrace real culture, we communicate with Amen and Amenet. There's no notion of the supreme being, great mother and great father, too busy to listen to Afurakani, Afurakani people, so we must only communicate to the deities, the lesser deities, because we can't communicate with the supreme being. That is a meme that was first released by the whites and their offspring. Our people have repeated that nonsense in, in various forms of liter literature across the board for decades, and it's never been accurate. The texts of ancient Kemet show that clearly. So, that's an early text. Go beyond. In fact, let me read one more excerpt from a pyramid text, Meru text, um, just for a little bit more context. This is from the Utterance 579, the tomb of Pepi II. So it says, This going forth from your house, O Asar, this Pepi, meaning this king Pepi. Is the going forth of Heru seeking you, O Asar, this Hepi, identifying him, him with Asar. Of course, that's a different divinity, so that destroys monotheism already. Your porters hasten, your couriers run, your heralds or messengers hurry. They announce to Ra that you have come, O Pepi, as the son of Geb upon the throne of Amen. So that's utterance 579 the tomb of Pepi II. Of course, they mention, they announced to Ra that you have come. They're telling, Pepi is being told that the couriers, the messengers, Pepi, the king, the Pera, the Ensu, um, the king, when he died, he made his transition. Now his spirit is going to the ancestral realm, Then he's going to go before the divinities in the ancestral realm to be honored and elevated, shown to be um, an honored ancestor in the ancestral realm. And as he's making his way to the ancestral realm and about to go before the divinities, they say, your porters hasten, your couriers run, your heralds or your messengers hurry. They announce, so the messengers are going before Pepe to announce to the deities that Pepe is coming. The spirit of Pepe is coming to the divinity. They announced to Ra that you have come as the son of Geb upon the throne of Amen. So it's a couple of things that are important here. First they, first, they announced to Ra. So Ra, of course, is the creator. 
Ra'et is the creatress, but they are grandchildren of Amen and Amenet. Amen and Amenet are the supreme beings, the two halves of the great divine whole. Ra and Ra'et are subordinate to the supreme being. So the creator and creatress are not the supreme being. They are subordinate to the supreme being. Anybody who engages real ancestral religion and embraces and connects with Amen, Amenet, Ra, and Ra, they know who they are. We know them, so we know the differences between them. But the whites and their offspring confound and conflate the creator with the supreme being and forced them and fused them into one concept, which is foolish. They did it deliberately. It's part of the propaganda of fusing all the deities together into one entity, making that entity white and making themselves the representative of that one white male entity or an invisible entity that's inferred to be white and inferred to be their father, so to speak. So, um, it's key to understand that Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress, are subordinate deities to the supreme being. It's also key to understand that, of course, they, they announce to Ra that you have come as the son of Geb upon the throne of Amen. Hepi here is identified with Osar. Osar is the divinity who dies and is resurrected and moves into the ancestral realm and, and it rules the spirit realm along with our set of course. Um, so when people made their transition, they identified with that process that Osar went through, of course. This is why in our Khan culture, Osar, Osir is called Awusi, the one who dies and alights and resurrects. Um, Ayisi, meaning the one who purifies the funerary process, and Ayi, Ayi is a funerary process. C means to purify, can mean that as well. So it's talking about the one who purifies the death and funerary process. And that process established now, we go through that same purification process in the after death state. When you make your transition, your spirit separates from your body. Some people, if they, if they lived in harmony with, you know, pretty much during time of their lives, just in a general way, they may not have been spiritually cultivated highly, but if they were fundamentally all right, normal people, not engaged in criminality and all kinds of nonsense, then they will naturally make a transition after spending, in our con culture, about 40 days with the family, um, visiting different family members as they're mourning. But then after that 40-day period, we begin to make a transition to the ancestral realm, Asamando, and then dwell with the ancestresses and ancestors, the Nananu Nsamanfo, and Asamanfo Pa, for generations, of course, until it's time for us to reincarnate through Bebra, through returning through birth, through one of our descendants, through the womb of one of our descendants, to be born into the world again as a baby, maybe 100, 200 years later. But we make that transition from the death state, and we move to the ancestral realm after about 40 days. Those who were kind of anxious, going through depression, suffering, going through a number of different things, that magnetism that they have still connected to the earthly family and so forth causes them to remain earthbound. They don't make that transition. They don't break away from that magnetic field, so to speak, of the earth. So they're still hanging around earthbound. They're hanging around the house that they died in, and people move into the house and they see that spirit hanging around. They hang around the spot where they were murdered on the street, and their spirit is still hanging around that spot. And people who are clairvoyant can see those people um, hanging around the spots where they were murdered. Now, people can engage in ritual to help those um, discarnate spirits move on from those places, but when they don't, they will just hang out. When you have a number of spirits like that hanging out because they're anxious, depressed, upset, angry, whatever. Sometimes they were, you know, criminals as well. Then when other people make their transition and they're not necessarily greatly spiritually cultivated, but they weren't necessarily criminal either. They're just kind of in and out. Maybe they were worshiping Jesus all their life, and once they made that transition, they realized there was no Jesus all along. So, or Muhammad or any other fake deity or personage, um, they're hanging around the family when they die for 40 days or so, 
when it's time for them to move along to the ancestral realm, they're not necessarily as spiritually grounded. So all those other negative, wayward, discarnate spirits who have been hanging out, some for hundreds of years, some for thousands, they can assault that newly departed spirit if that spirit doesn't have any protection. They can pull them in one direction or the other. It's just like somebody, you know, leaving their house and going into a very, very bad neighborhood where there are a number of drug addicts, alcoholics, all walking around. They see you come up. They start coming in your direction, start asking you for money. You don't know if they have a weapon. You don't know what they're going to do and so forth. You get surrounded by 10 people or something like that. The same thing happens when somebody is newly deceased. They make their transition, but they're not necessarily spiritually cultivated, per se. They may have, have had some anxiety, some depression or anger or whatever, which magnetically kind of keeps them towards the earth, um, earthbound to a certain extent. Didn't necessarily have a great relationship with their ancestresses and ancestors or a strong one, so they're not pulled or inclined in that direction. And they get assaulted by some of these discarnate spirits. That's been happening for thousands of years. So when Osar goes through the death process and purifies the death process and we create funerary processes to help the ancestral spirit, newly departed spirit, trans, transport, transfer a transition from the after-death state being earthbound directly to the ancestral realm and avoiding and overcoming the negative influence of these wayward discarnate spirits and you can move through them you have protection now. Um, Osar did that first, charted the way, and then everybody who follows behind that example can navigate their way through these negative entities and get to the ancestral realm unscathed. So this is why people identify with Osar in the after-death state. It's not that he's the quote-unquote god of the dead, per se. He purifies the transitional process, and then we follow that protocol so that we can make our transition. Of course, our set and Nebit Het are key in that process. We have articles on the Akra Dean Boson page where we get into detail about Akua, who is Nebit Het, in that process, and so forth, and a video as well. So we got the links on the page. You can get some information about that. So this is what it's talking about in this particular text. Pepe being identified with Osar, the deity who killed, died, go through the you know transition process, eventually resurrected, operates as a divinity of force in nature, of course. So when they say um, this Pepe um, identifying him with Osar, um, then they say your porters hast and your couriers run, your heralds hurry, these messengers going before this spirit who's about to. Um, present himself before the divinities after he's made his transition. They announce the Ra that you have come. Oh, this Osar or King Pepe, as the son of Geb on the throne of our men. Osar is the son of Geb and Nut. So they said, as the son of Geb upon the throne of our men. Of course, this is in the pyramid text, Meru text, um, quote unquote, old kingdom. Then you get to the Middle Kingdom, so-called Middle Kingdom, um, you know, hundreds of years later, and you're talking about Amen, the um, king of the thrones, a ruler of the thrones of the two lands, lord of the throne of the two lands, master of the throne of the two lands, and so forth. When they talk about in this ancient pyramid text, Meru text, um, talking about Pepe as the son of Geb, they're identifying him number one, in the text, as I saw, but when they call him the son of Geb, they once again are inferring he's identified similar to the function as the son of Geb, meaning Osar, being identified with Osar, upon the throne of Amen. This again establishes Amen, just like Amen and Amenet, as the great king, throne, master of the thrones of the two lands, the great Supreme being, great father, of course I'm in that great mother. They mentioned Geb, they mentioned Ra, they mentioned Osar, different deities. This is not monotheism. Only a fool can read this and try to morph it into monotheism and try to say these are just representations of different aspects of Ashe and 
nonsense like that. They begin to contort various definitions, twist and turn into pretzels to force that foolish notion of monotheism because deep down inside they feel that polytheism, which is reality, is inferior because they worship the whites and their offspring. It's only the whites and their offspring who told you that monotheism is superior and polytheism is inferior. In reality, monotheism doesn't even exist. It's a foolish concept that was created politically for the purposes of control. So we need to snap out of that. So that's the ancient these pyramid text. Now let's get to uh we're gonna get to uh later text. Eighteen eighteenth, nineteenth dynasty, just to give some more context. We're gonna look now, we, we have some quotes from the late what was called the Laden Papyrus I three fifty in our book. Anidaho, awareness. We're talking about the cosmology of Amen and Amenet. In this particular book, it's a number of different articles compiled into one volume. Uh, this is one of our soft cover books as well. We're showing the origin of the term God, which is a title, Ga, nasal, Ga, Ganga, which is a title of Amen and Amenet, showing them in their forms of their Achinebwa animal totems as the great goose and the great gander, who cackle at the beginning of creation, causing the black primordial waters of the black substance of space, the formless waters to begin to move and vibrate. Their cackle, their vibrations cause that movement. And then the creation of the various divinities, primordial divinities, and later the creation of the sun and the moon and the various stars and the earth mother and so forth. But it begins with Amen and Amenet in the form of the great Ganga Ur, Ganga Et Uret, or Uri the great goose and great gander who are cackling Ganga. And of course, the term Ganga or Nganga, the root is Ga, meaning to cackle. It also means to pour, means to invoke, means to pour. To cackle, invoke, to call, as well as to pour, as in pour libation. And what streams from the lips of the great goose and great gander, the Ganga or the Ganga Urit, are the vibratory frequencies that causes the water that spills into the primordial waters and causes those primordial waters to vibrate and pr create eventually the, the egg upon w from which the sun will be born at the creation of the world. So we go into detail about that and that a number of different things in, in, in that this particular book, but we just want to get to the specific section where we um, highlighted some text from ancient Kemet, we already went to the very oldest text, the religious composition anywhere in the world, which is the Meru text, showing Amen and Amenet together, male and female balance at the beginning of creation. We show when you when you check these articles out on our books out, you'll see images and our website, you'll see the image of Amen and Amenet. We've placed that on numerous pages on the website so people can actually see them together. So remind ourselves that there's a great father and a great mother, of course. Um, from the so-called Laden Papyrus I-350, Chapter 90, regarding Amen. So it says, light was his coming into existence on the first occasion with all that exists in stillness for all of him. He, meaning Amen, cackled by voice as the great cackler, Ganga Ur, coming into a land that he created for himself. He began speaking in the midst of silence, opening every eye and causing them to look. He began crying out while the world was in stillness. His yell or his cackle, as the great cackle, of course, circulated while he and none like him had none like him, so that he might give birth to what is and cause them to live and cause every man to know the way to walk. Their hearts live when they see him. Um, and then another section from chapter 100 the one who initiated existence on the first occasion, Amen, who developed in the beginning, whose origin is unknown. But then we go up a complementary text, talking about Amen, of course, from the Temple of Heb, which the whites and our spring called Hybis, um, columns 23 and 24, and it says, quote, your ancient throne is the Kayet, the highland of Kemenu, 
It is from the lake of two knives that you reach land. It is from the water surface that you appear in the hidden egg, Amenet being with you. So now that was a late period text. The late in papyrus I-350 is a, a New Kingdom, quote-unquote, text. And then we went to the text going all the way back to the beginning, the first um, re oldest religious composition, the Meru text from the 5th and 6th dynasty, showing Amen, Amenet together, talking about different divinities. So we have texts from different periods talking about different deities. We're going to read one more section. Um, we just want to read something quick. In fact, let's go back to the time of Hatshepsut. What does Hatshepsut have to say about the deity? On one of the, uh, the Tekkenu or obelisks of Hatshepsut that she created, she wrote a long inscription talking about why did she create this Tekken, this so-called obelisk or this Tekken, and she said she was guided by her father, Amen. And she talked about, uh, my heart urged me to make for him, meaning Amen, two Tekkenu with charm or golden electro electrum um, covering the pyramidians or the pointed tops of which should pierce the sky in the august colonnade between the two great uh, pylons in the Temple of Amen, of the king, the mighty bull, the king of the south and north, our uh, capital Kara, the Heru, whose voice speaks truth. Behold, my heart took possession or overcame me, leading me to utter words. Then she announces to the people, O ye men of understanding, the Rekitu, the, the wise people, who will look upon my monument after years, meaning in the future, who will discuss together what I have done, take good heed that you say not, I know not, I know not why these were made and why a mountain was made throughout in gold as if it was one of the commonest things that exists. So she's saying, listen, for people, wise people in the future, I'm setting this out now, I'm putting this text on the Tekken so you will understand and you won't wonder why did she make these Tekkenu as monuments to the great God, Amen, her father, Amen. I'm going to tell you why I did what I did. She says that I swear that as Ra loves me and as my father, Amen, has shown me faith, favor, and as the child of my nostrils, meaning the breath, is with life and serenity, and as I bear the white crown and I am crowned with the red crown, and have joined together in amity for the two hawk divinities, their divisions of the world, and have governed this land like the son of Aset, meaning Hor, Heru, and am mighty like the son of Nut, meaning Osar, and as Ra sets in the sextet boat in the evening and appears joyfully in the Adet boat in the morning and joins his two divinities, two mothers in the boat of the gods, and as heaven is established firmly and as what he, meaning Ra, has made is stable or immovable, I shall have my being forever and ever like an Ansekev star, one of the circumpolar stars um, that never set. And then it says, I shall sink to rest in life like Atem. So these two great Tekkenu, um, which my majesty has worked with the charm for my father, Amen, in order that my name shall abide and flourish, shall stand in this temple forever and forever. So that long piece is saying, she says, I swear, as, I swear that as Ra loves me and as my father, Amen, has shown me favor, that she mentions uh, Heru, the son of Asar and Aset. She mention, mentions Asar, the son of Nut and Geb. She mentions Ra again. She mentions Atem and so forth. She's mentioning all of these divinities. They're not all the same divinity. There's a separation between, for example, Ra, Amen, Atem, Asar, Heru, Aset, and so forth. We're talking about different divinities. On the front cover, um, or on the 
image of the event notification, we showed an image of Ramesu, of so-called Ramses or Ramesu II, and he's sitting in a temple in between Amen, who's sitting to his right, Ra is sitting to his left, and second to his uh, right is Ptah. So you have Amen, Ra, and Ptah, three separate deities, and Ramesu the third is the second is sitting in between them. Amen, Ra, and Ptah are not all the same deity. They're three separate divinities. The sculpture, of course, and the reliefs and so forth prove that. Now, Amen is Inyame or Inyame in Akan. Ra is the young component in Akan. Pata is Boada or Boade in Akan, three separate divinities. That's easily seen in the text. That's easily seen in the sculptures, relief sculptures, standalone sculptures, um, colossal sculptures, and so forth, all over ancient Kemet, in the murals, in the temples, in the tombs, everywhere you will find these different divinities depicted. When you read the actual text, you will see that they're speaking about one another. They'll talk about the different functions or aspects of creation that the different deities operate through. It is very clear. So black people who are brainwashed by the whites in their offering will sit and read and look at all of this information and will step back and still try to force all of these many divinities all into one, typically one male divinity, because they've been so controlled by the whites in their offspring that the evidence staring them in the face, they reject all of it because the whites in their offspring said, no, monotheism is key. So they begin to try to contort definition. They just represent functions and uh, different aspects of the one true God. We didn't believe in many gods and goddesses. Pure nonsense. And anybody who takes the time to actually read these texts no longer simply listening to people who call themselves comedic priests and priestesses or call themselves traditional Akan, Yoruba, and everything else, start engaging the process yourself, getting the information from these texts yourself, but also engaging the actual Abosom, Orisha, Vodou yourself, and your Nananom, Nsamapo, your Egungun, Kuvito yourself, who are connected to you by blood, and connecting with Amen and Aminet yourself through the agency of your own Kra or Krawa, your soul, your divine consciousness. When you do that, you will know exactly who they are. They will communicate with you. They communicate with us. They've always done that. They communicate with adults. They communicate with children. You don't have to be a priest or priestess to communicate with Amen, Aminet, Nyame, Nyamewa, and so forth. If somebody tells you you cannot communicate with them, these are Negroes who are either lying to you deliberately or typically the vast majority of them have been so infected with a pseudo-culture, Islam, Christianity, and so forth, that's infected the culture that they haven't even attempted to engage real religion. They haven't even attempted to embrace Nyame and Inyamewa. They don't even know that that's a reality because they've been sold such nonsense. Okay, so let's get in the chat room real quick. I just want to make sure we don't didn't miss any um, questions. Um, okay, there's a quick question, and that's something that actually we're going to deal with in an upcoming show about the, the tale of the shipwrecked sailor. They mentioned the 75 serpents um, connected with um, the great serpent on that particular island. So the story is about a sailor who was shipwrecked in ancient Kemet. He lands in the um, island of Puanito Pant, which is in southern Afuraka, southeastern Afuraka, Afuraka, around where Somalia is now in that, in that region, Sudan, Somalia, and so forth. Um, and, and then he talks about how it was a great bearded serpent um, who picked him up and saved him and eventually, you know, protected him until it was time that he was able to return home and so forth, and he told the story once he got back home. And the, the great serpent told him about there were 75 serpents on the island before the island submerged. And, well, well 75 serpents, they lived together 
um, before a catastrophe happened. And then eventually, um, once the shipwrecked sailor left the island, then the island itself ended up submerging. The island is called Opunin Ka, meaning island of island this of the Ka. Again, we talk about the island, the Ka, the first landmass to rise up, and it's called the island of the Ka, Opunin Ka, which is like a variation of Opunaka or Opunaka, so to speak. We mentioned this in the Opunaka, Opunaka, origin of the term Africa book. Um, and we're going to get into this particular text in the near future, just so you know. There's a particular text um, called the, they'll, they'll, they'll call it the Litany of Ra, but what it is is um, Invocations to Ra. And there are 75 forms of Ra, as they call it, 75 divinities associated with Ra. So when they talk about the 75 serpents um, connected with this um, feathered or uh, bearded serpent divinity, on an island of a Ka, and he's a creative power. Um, it's talking about the 75 um, spirits of Ra. So we're going to get into that in an upcoming um, broadcast. So may I say for asking about that, but we're going to do some details on that. So that's important with regard to identity and, and cosmology and the nature of Ka and so forth. Um, all right. So another question, what are some rituals that we can perform to assist spirits with moving on so as not to affect us. Also, where can we read up, read more up on this? For people on a on an average everyday basis, the key for us, so, so if you have a spirit like that who are related to you, um, related to your blood circle, the key for you is to, of course, establish a shrine for your own insamanfo. You don't call um, discarnate entities who are not related to you to your ancestor shrine at all, even if it was a foster parent, you know what I mean, or somebody who was a friend of the family or somebody who raised you or whatever, and you, they felt, you felt like they were your mother or father, grandmother, grandfather, whatever. If they're not blood-related, they are not your ancestresses and ancestors when they make their transition. They have their own ancestresses and ancestors, their own blood circle, so they must deal with their own people. Um, so when you have people who are actually related to you, blood-wise, who make their transition or are going through that, um, the key is to establish a shrine for your insamanfo, who, of course, they are related to as well. And when you strengthen the bonds that you have with your insamanfo and the communication you have with your non-anoma insamanfo, then they will help that process that person will be drawn to what you're doing, to your shrine, but that will also draw them towards the unsamanfo that they have been repelling or rejecting. It's just kind of like somebody who's on crack to a certain extent. Somebody comes out and tries to help them, help them get off the street, help them get into a rehab program or whatever, and then they resist for a while. But then once you have certain people begin to try to help, they'll come and connect with that person. They recognize they need to do something different. Once they connect with that person, maybe that person is a social worker or a case manager or something like that, and that person is able to connect with them, then they can bring them into the fold of other people who are engaged in the healing process as well. So if it's not your specific responsibility, meaning coming into the world to serve as that kind of vessel to connect with ancestral spirits and help move them from one direction, from one position to the next, definitely you can, through your own ancestral shrine, connecting with your own Nsumampo and developing a bond with them, um, asking them for assistance with that individual. Uh, the stronger you get with your Nsumampo, the stronger your magnetism is. It's just like a, you know, a smaller magnet getting closer to the large magnet, which is like the Nsumampo, and then you know, you get into that field, that magnetic field, and you have a stronger pull, so you begin to draw. Just like, you, just like when you begin to engage in ritual practice, transform some things about your life, people who begin to embrace ancestral religion begin to reorder their lives. So if they were engaged in drug use and things like that, ritually they can go through a process, and we have ritual methods to, for people to get off of drugs and alcohol and things like that. 
They start transforming their lives, transforming their behavior, and people notice something different. They, they have a stronger, more vibrant um, aura, a spiritual force, and they're more magnetic. They start drawing other people. People want to, who you know, want to get in harmony with order as well. They're naturally drawn to the individual to find out what are they doing, why are they in harmony with order, and what can I do to get. They, they may not use those terms, but that's what they're feeling, and they want to get more information than they're drawn. You develop that kind of magnetism. It's the same thing when you're dealing with your insomnia. You develop that kind of draw, that kind of magnetism when you get in harmony with order. So now these discarnate wayward spirits who are just out there flailing, when somebody is grounded and they have a strong magnetism that they're developing, which is based in order, they start pulling those ancestral spirits closer to them. When you start pulling them closer to you, then your non-anoma and Samafo have greater access to them because they've been rejecting them for a while. The individual has been rejecting the overtures from the Samafo um, for a while, but now you become like a um, go-between to a certain extent um, simply by developing a strong relationship to your Samafo. And the second question is really the same answer as the one we just gave you, your, your question, what rituals can be performed if one believes that they may be influenced by a discarnate spirit. First thing, and if, if you look at our, our book, uh, the Okra, Okra Complex, the soul of our Kanpo, we're talking about the nature and function of the Kra, the soul, the divine consciousness, called Ka and Ka in ancient Kemet, Fordari, Inu, and Yoruba, um, Selido and Bodun, Chi and Ibo and so forth. That is the deity that dwells in the head region that grounds you. It's the force that's assigned to you by Nyamewa, Nyamewa, Amenet, Amen, pre-incarnation to dwell with you throughout your life in your head region. And that deity that's in your head region, your own cry, your own soul, you communicate with, you give offerings to periodically and so forth so you can align your thoughts, intentions, and actions with that divine force in creation, that divine, that divinely ordered force. Anytime that we have some issues or some problems, whether it's with this kind of spirits or negative behavior or whatever, it bespeaks a, a fundamental, somewhat disalignment from our own crop. So you want to get in alignment with your crop. That's the key to re being able to repel discarnate entities. If you're engaged in any kind of negative, self-destructive behavior, you lower your spiritual immunity. It's absolutely no different than physically. When you engage in negative physical behavior, you lower your spiritual immunity. So not only if you decide you're not going to get enough sleep, you run yourself all day, all night or whatever, only get a few hours of sleep consistently, you become fatigued, that can lower your immunity. If you don't eat right, eating McDonald's and stuff like that and drinking Pepsi and Coke and all that kind of stuff and not eating um, foods with, you know, vitamins, minerals, green foods and stuff like that. You're not eating properly. You're not getting enough sleep, um, allowing yourself to um, respond in a self-destructive, emotional fashion, creating unnecessarily stress within your body, lowering your immunity. That can happen just engaged in those kind of rituals, I mean, those kind of behaviors, it lowers your physical immunity. Now you're more likely to catch that quote-unquote cold that everybody at the office has. Normally if they catch, you know, people come down with the flu or something like that, you walk through the office, it bounces right off you, no problem. When you compromise your own immunity, weaken yourself, then those things can get to you. Um, if you engage in further self-destructive behavior like alcoholism, drug use, um, other things like that, you automatically begin to lower your physical immunity and you can succumb easily to all kinds of disease, viral infections, bacterial infections that normally you would be able to repel. It's the same thing spiritually. When you get out of harmony with order and thoughts, intentions, and actions, even if you before you get to the action, the thoughts and the intentions that generate matrices within your spirit, within your quote-unquote mind, within your spirit, 
matrices that are disordered that draw negativity to you because they're like a magnet, those thoughts and then those intentions, misguided desires, lust, malice, and so forth, then you set yourself up to not be able to repel discarnate viral-type, bacterial-type spirits, wayward discarnate disease, but now they can penetrate your aura. Your aura becomes more porous. It becomes like Swiss cheese instead of, you know, like it normally would be, and now they have openings to get in. There are chinks in your armor now. You're not just repelling them like, you know, the corona of the sun will burn up something before it even gets to the sun. The spirit, your, your aura can repel negative entities when it's vibrant and powerful because you're in harmony with order. But when you get out of harmony, engaging in self-destructive activity in some fashion, that's one means by which you can begin to compromise your spiritual immunity. And now these parasites can latch on to you. So the first thing you want to do, of course, is engage a process where you realign with your kra. Check out the Okra Okra Complex book. Of course, the ebook version is a free download. We have the soft cover version as well. We also have a two-and-a-half-hour video where we examine the information in the book step-by-step. Step. That's a free video as well. You can check that out on the website. Um, and we also talk about establishing a shrine so you sit down and communicate with your own crop. That's one thing. And, of course, developing a strong relationship with your nana no for your spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. They are the first line of defense to repel discarnate wayward spirits who would try to otherwise affect you. And then we have articles um, dealing with ancestral shrine communication and so forth. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so another quick question. I have two shrines in my home, and the shrine for my Akai is a wooden statue of the bust of an Afurakani male, and the other shrine I have is a wooden bust of an Afurakani female. That is, that is the shrine for my Nananom, Unsamanfo, as well as the Abosom. Is this all right to have one shrine for both your Unsamanfo and the Abosom? Okay. Typically, what you have a shrine for your nananom and samanfo. That's there. That's when you communicate directly with them, your grandparents and so forth. Um, the shrine for that's nananom and samanfo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. The shrine for your abosom and akan culture, the kradin bosom, the abosom that governs your kra, that will be separate from the shrines of the samanfo. So typically... The uh, shrines for Abosom and Unsamanfo are separated. So the shrine for your Ka, your Kra itself, your Ka or your Kra is an Abosom in and of itself. So the other Abosom sometimes will make their presence felt through that particular shrine as well, even though the central divinity is, of course, the shrine to your Ka, your Kra. But typically the Abosom and then some awful shrines are separate. Orisha and a Gugun shrines are separate and so forth. All right. Okay, so we, we're going to, we have a call we want to get to. Okay, Michiowo, uh, number 5808, you had a question or a comment? Yes, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, thank you. I have uh, posed this question before, and I'm glad that I finally was able to catch your show to call in a better answer that I uh, and that's more reassuring to me concerning you know the fact that we have, particularly in North America, have been so polluted um, and so removed from our uh, ancestral religion and the traditions that, um, you know, those of us who are really sincerely seeking out a connection to our ancestral religion, we sought out, you know, priests and other spiritual people who, you know, gave us instructions about how to 
uh, give offerings to certain orishas and how to ask for intervention from certain orishas for, to affect certain outcomes, you know, circumstances and situations. And I have done that, you know, when I've been dealing with um, really serious and high stakes situations. You know, I went to a trusted person who was a babalao, or so he said, and he gave me bad advice. And, you know, when dealing with these things, are we opening ourselves up to, um, you know, evil and wicked spirits, or are we just, you know, communicating to nothing or no one? And um, if we have opened ourselves up, you know, how can we know that, you know, how can we get ourselves clean or how can we know that how to get back on the right path? Okay. And I appreciate that question. Um, and and the elements are of the answer are, are right in the question. So, yes, it's a case-by-case case basis. Sometimes you have opened yourself up to nothing because, you know, the individual was not working with anything anyway. And sometimes that later becomes apparent because nothing is happening. Um, sometimes you may open yourself up or make, make yourself more receptive to some discarnate, wayward, individual, deceased, you know, homeless-type spirit or whatever, no different than if you went into a bad neighborhood and opened your, got out your car and left the window down and the keys in the car and the car running or whatever, if some homeless spirit or some homeless individual is hanging out or walking around, they may decide they want to get in the car. You know what I'm saying? Because it's an open invitation. And, of course, when you got back, you would run them out. So it's a case-by-case thing, depending on who you connected with and what they asked you to do or whatever. Yes, sometimes it's nothing happening, and sometimes you can open yourself to, you know, um, homeless spirits, just like we can do that in the physical world. And whenever we have these questions, we always you can always find the parallel sometimes the parallel in the body, the way things work in the body, but also in the physical world. So just like we can do these things in the physical world and open ourselves up to negative people, ignorant people or whatever, um, we can also open ourselves up to those same kind of people because they, they remain that way even when they transition. Um, the key to reestablishing that order, um, what you said in the beginning about, you know, we had lost to a certain extent our traditions in this part of the world because of the Musu al-Kesti, the great perversity, enslavement, and so forth, certain certain specific outer forms or expressions of the culture we had no longer engaged in, but the essence of the culture never left because if you can communicate or get possessed by your ancestors as an ancestor or you can see them moving around, they can move through you, if you can get possessed by the abosom, then the culture exists because that's where all of the culture comes from. The embodiments of divine order are the forces in nature. They are the spirits that animate sun, moon, planets, stars, black substance, space, oceans, rivers, atmosphere, and so forth. They animate those. They're the spirits that animate those physical aspects of reality. They can get inside of us and move us around. We still get possessed in America, whether we are we were on a plantation getting possessed, like Nat Turner or Harriet Tubman, or even some of our people went up into some churches and would still get possessed by an ancestral spirit who would lead them out of the church, by the way, or a deity who would lead them out of the church. But as long as we can get possessed, we're still doing divination, people engaged in juju and voodoo and hoodoo and so forth, healing people, picking herbs, healing, you know, teaching, telling things, people things that would happen before they happen. We still have the essence of the culture. So right. once we understand that, and it's real, then we embrace it, meaning reconnecting, no matter what has happened, no matter what ritual somebody has done or whatever, the deities themselves are not slaves. So it's, it's no such thing as as long as you have the right formula and the right sacrifice and you engage in the right ritual practice or prayer that will make the Orisha do this and that. They are not slaves, even though the whites and their offspring and Negroes who embrace that ideal will try to make slaves out of the dead. They do not hmm. obey us. They only obey Nyamewa 
and Iame, Amenet, Amen, Olorun, Olokun, Mawu, and Lisa, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, the great father and the great mother, the deities only obey them. If the supreme being directs them to engage us in a certain fashion, that's what they will do. They don't obey us, even though some Negroes will try to say they obey us. <laughs> so, but even that <laughs> goes back to Negroes who have embraced false tradition. So since they're not slaves, they don't just do whatever somebody tells them to do, and they don't just do something because a certain ritual was created or affected, and now they, mm-hmm. they're, you know, pulled against their will, and now they have to think this is not, you know, when you see those shrines, like we said yesterday, shrines, you know, pots and things like that, the mm-hmm. Orisha, the Abosom are not bad, and they're not stuck in a pot and can't get out until we let them out with, a, you know, a magical formula. It doesn't, that's not what's happening. They're the same spirit that animates the sun, which is 93 million miles away from here, or the black substance of space of the entire planet Earth, these are the forces that we're dealing with. They're not little slaves. So they will mm. not do anything out of harmony with our own crop because they are spirits of order. They embody divine order. Our mm-hmm. ancestors and ancestors who are honorable will never do anything that is out of harmony with divine order. They are, it's in, it's in, they're incapable of doing something out of harmony with order. So the only kind of spirit that can do anything that's outside of order is, you know, some homeless, criminal, anxiety be filled, depressed spirit who made the transition and are angry. So those are the kind of spirits that, and criminals, you know what I'm saying, who've made the transition, they're still criminal and lustful and malicious now. Mm-hmm. Um, those are the only ones that can try to do something, just like they're the only ones who would have tried to do something while they were alive. Mm-hmm. So once you develop a strong relationship with your nanano and samanfo, you begin to repel those entities just like you develop a strong relationship with a large group of your family members. If somebody tries to come in the house, now you have a whole group of family members who will attack that individual and eradicate that individual. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to our direct blood ancestresses and ancestors, which, of course, we have direct access to. These are our family members. So we're not dependent on somebody else to talk to our grandparents. Just like physically, we're not dependent on somebody as a go-between to talk to our grandparents. We're not dependent on somebody now to set up a shrine for us to communicate with our great-grandparents. It is their responsibility as Nananoma and Samanfo, spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors, to assist us in our development. They are assigned to us to do that. So to the degree that we are receptive to them, we will get that information from them and that direction from them, and we will no longer neglect urges from them that we may not have contextualized as urges or messages coming from them in the past. Maybe mm-hmm. we're like, oh, I felt like I should do this, but I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. And that was actually an urge from our Samafu to keep us out of a certain situation um, or give us some information. So the more you connect with them, your communication becomes more clear and more direct, and you can you know, navigate your way through these situations. And you will develop that re- Propulsion we were talking about, just like the magnets on the table, when you get get grounded and strong with the Kra and with Yun Samanfo, you develop that magnetic repulsion that will repel wayward, weak, discarnate spirits who otherwise are lustful and malicious and trying to cause, you know, harm to you. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, the, the concern I have is that because, you know, I've I follow the advice of people who I think may have given me bad advice, particularly like when it came to setting up my, you know, ancestral altar. You okay. know, putting things on there that shouldn't be there. So will the, my spiritually cultivated ancestors reject me now that if I in the past did, you know, created an altar that was wrong? No, no, because, again, now these are your... Now, think about, and I always associate it with the physical. You can even associate it uh-huh. with yourself. So mm-hmm. you being a, say you were a great-grandparent, and, you know, you saw one of your great-grandchildren doing something wrong because, because somebody told them to, you know, to do something that was foolish. And mm-hmm. they did it. 
And then they realized later, man, this was ignorant. I wonder if my great-grandmother is going to still try to talk to me. Of course, you're going to still try to communicate with them. And the same thing with our Samanfo, our Nananoma Samanfo. You weren't engaged in that process out of malice or lust or, you know, foolish just like mm-hmm. that. You just got this information. So as long as your thoughts and intentions were pure but you just didn't have the correct information, they're not going to reject you. The only time they will reject you is if you have rejected your own crowd and you were engaged in malicious mm-hmm. and or lustful activity, perverse mm-hmm. desires, criminality, and all other kinds of nonsense, mm-hmm. and you were, re- you were consciously rejecting their overtures, then that's a problem. But if you were just mm-hmm. trying to do mm-hmm. what you were supposed to do, somebody gave you some bad information, and even if you maybe didn't recognize your insomnia were trying to tell you something different or maybe neglected or procrastinated or whatever, um, no, they're not going to reject you. You're trying to get on the right track. Now, one thing that happens, um, and which has happened to numerous people, and it's just across the board, similar things. Sometimes you connect with somebody. They're giving you false information, making little talismans, making this, making that telling you to put this mm-hmm. on your shrine, mm-hmm. telling you to do this, right. do that, and all this other stuff. What we do is take all those things and throw all those things out. Throw them out. Right. Get rid of all of them and reestablish yeah, your shrine based on your insomnia. You do not have to go back to the person and ritually give them back their stuff. And all. You ain't got to do none of mm-hmm. that because it was never connected with the Abosom in the first place. Some mm-hmm. of them will try to make you believe that you have to go to them and ritually dispose of their little perverse talisman or else it's going to cause you all kinds of problems. People operate, you know, try to make people operate based on fear. It's funny how they can't do that same thing with the whites and their offspring who are controlling their neighborhoods or something, you know what I'm saying? But but uh-huh. when they're trying to, you know, uh, control somebody in the neighborhood. Um, so, you don't, the only time you ritually return something to somebody is, or, or, you know, engage in some kind of ritual like that is if you have a real shrine. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, when it's one of these little fake, this kind of wayward spirits, these are crackhead-type spirits, you know, criminal-type spirits. You take mm-hmm. that, those little talismans or whatever they gave and destroy, throw them all out, get rid of them, and reestablish your shrine anew with none of that perverse energy. We've had numerous people who have gone through that process, um, whether here and even on the continent, they had to get rid of that stuff, get that negative energy, because mm-hmm. it's a magnet, it's a magnet for those spirits that were attached to it. So you get rid of that and reestablish the shrine, pure, basic. And we have an article talking about a basic shrine set up, clear glass bowl with a stone, water. Yes, I saw that. Right. So just a basic fundamental thing is in your insomnia from your clan, your people, they'll direct you as to what they want on the shrine and what they do not want on the shrine as it further develops. And that that'll be a process of development. It won't all be won't all mm-hmm. be the same day that they tell you go get this and that and this and that. Right. It'll be periodic. But the basic fundamental setup is, you know, just a basic setup that we put in the article that anybody can Start off with. Will they tell? Will the, do the, did the ancestors reveal who wants uh, a bosom is? Because I have no idea. I mean, I think I was born on a Thursday, but I have to, you know, look back at the the uh, right. birth records. So that that will come. Yeah, that'll come through just connecting because this is your typically what we in a in a normal setting we will learn about our ancestral culture directly from our parents, grandparents, Mm -hmm. you know, aunts and uncles and so forth in a village setting, whatever. Um, And that's the way, you know, we learn about the culture. Um, Because of what happened with us, being transferred over here, um, most of our parents, grandparents and so forth are not involved in the culture. They got caught up in Christianity or something like that. Mm -hmm. So they don't, they can't teach us the culture. So we have to get the culture from our great-grandparents which are the Insomnia, which is not a negative thing. They'll right. teach us who we are, you know, show us who we are without misinformation, 
without a cut on the product, you know what I'm saying? So they'll, they'll teach us who we are, give us direct information. They'll help confirm it for us in the course of everyday life. They put people in front of us to confirm these things. And then if you find out that you're Basa, you start studying Basa language and culture and cosmology. If you find out that you're um, Igbo, then you start studying Igbo culture, language, and cosmology just to give more mm -hmm. nuance and details to what you're studying. But the key is um, connecting with your own direct blood relatives, and they will give you that information, They'll give you what clan you come from, and direct you towards how you need to navigate and operate in your own clan structure. But it starts off with connecting with them. Yeah, I, I guess that is the, the key, the, right. the starting point. Exactly. Because that's the okay. that's the primary institution of learning within ancestral religion, is that ancestral shrine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never realized how serious that was. Yep, that's, uh, until that's lately. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for indulging my questions. I'll continue to listen. Oh, Merase, no problem. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for okay, so for individuals, just as a programming note, um, there are about four minutes, three minutes left in the broadcast on the live stream on the internet. So if you're in the chat room or if you're just listening live via the internet, um, it will cut off in three minutes. If you would like to listen on the phone past eleven o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, then you would have to call in within the next three minutes. We'll probably go into overtime for a few minutes. Um, so the call-in number is 657-383-0635, 657-383-0635. Call in within the next two and a half minutes now, and then you'll be able to stay on the phone and continue to listen um, on the phone line after 11 o'clock, but you only have less than two and a half minutes now. For those who are still online, of course, tomorrow we will be back on uh, for EGUA Marketplace Day. Our guest will be Enna Njideka Carmo, who is the founder and the guardian director of Fawo Hodie Suya, which is Pan-African Educational Online um, educational co-op online classes, and also Sankofa Fare, which is um, drumming, traditional dance, and so forth. Uh, but they're starting up their online educational, Pan-African educational online co-op classes on September 21st. We're going to get into that information. It's going to be a great show. So uh, tune in tomorrow, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on this channel for that. Um, that's going to be a great discussion. So, again, and again, the num call the number for the next uh, less than 90 seconds, 657-383-0635. Again, 657 to call in. All right. And I think the chat room will stay up. The chat room, I think, stays open a little bit past 11. It's just the live stream listening. Um, you can't hear past 11. All right, so, so we went into the detail about the reality of where monotheism came from politically. Um, text talking about Amen, Amenet, mentioning these different divinities and so forth. Um, let us go just briefly to the Akra Dean Bosom page on the website, and we just want to highlight some information there about the differences between certain abosom. Um, we're, in upcoming shows, especially on the Akampo Nanasom show, we're going to get into um, specifics about specific divinities and spend a whole show talking about certain divinities. We already touched on the reality that, for example, Amen, Amnet, Great Father, Great Mother, are the supreme being working together as one unit. Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress, are grandchildren of the supreme being. 
We go into detail about that in our Cry or Cry Complex and Soul of Our Confo, as well as other publications. Um, we wanted to show something, just talking about the Akradin Bosom, yeah, Bosom of the seven days of the week, but how Bosom they govern the solar, lunar, and planetary bodies which govern the seven day week. And we mentioned this in the previous broadcast, but just to give an overview, uh, the Abosom, these are the deities, goddesses, and gods, the divine spirit forces in creation. They are referred to as Inyamewa, Inyame, Ma, or the children of Inyamewa, Inyame, the children of Amen, Amenet. We show an image of Amen and Amenet. And the key here is uh, the Abosom are the Asunsum, meaning the spirits operating through the many suns, moons, stars, planetary bodies, oceans, rivers, mountains, wind, fire, and the black substance of space, comprising Abodier, or creation. They are the divine organs regulating order within the great divine body of Amenet, Amen, or Inyamewa, Inyame, just as your organs, which are smaller bodies, regulate order within the greater body, which is you. Um, we mentioned that the Akradin Bosom here on this page are a particular grouping of our Bosom, with divinities as they are called in our Khan culture, and we have an article about each of these 11 major divinities in this particular grouping, but there are, of course, hundreds of Abosom, hundreds of Orisha, hundreds of Bodu, Ntoru, Ntoru to deities that animate creation. They are the embodiments of divine order within creation. They regulate order just like all of your organs regulate order in your body. And of course, your cells are children of the organs. We as Afurakani, Afurakani people, and only Afurakani, Afurakani people are the cells within the organs, within the great divine body of the Supreme Being. That is our relationship to the Supreme Being. Uh, one thing that we wanted to mention that we show on this page, um, not only do we have a chart showing these 11 major abosom and their association with the, an identity with the Orisha and the Yoruba tradition, the Vodou and the Fauna and Ebe tradition, and, of course, the same deities in ancient Kemet um, and Kanit, Egypt and Nubia, of course. But we show, for example, we have articles dealing with Ra and Ra'et. We have an article, 30-page article, Nyonkompon and Nyonkonton Ra Ra'et, showing that in the Akan tradition, Nyonkompon and the Nyonkonton are Ra and Ra'et, the creator and creatress in the Akan tradition. We have an article dealing with Odomankoma, showing that Atem Kepra in Akan tradition. We have an article about Tridriampon with Kepra in the Akan tradition. Um, Odomankoma is Atem, who is sometimes called Atem Kepra, but it's Atem. So Odomankoma is Atem, and Tredrian Pong is Kepra in the Akan tradition. These are different deities with different functions in creation. They work together just like your different organs work together. But they are, every organ in your body is different. It has a different form. It has a different function. They are interrelated, but they are separate entities in and of themselves that work together to maintain and regulate order within the great body, which is yours. Ra, Ra'et, Kepra, Keprit, Pata, Sechima, or Sekmet, uh, Atem, Asaset, Nebet, Hetepet. Um, all these different divinities are separate, distinct divinities. Divine spirit forces in creation that have their own identity, have their own consciousness, have their own voice. They communicate with us. They possess us during ritual. They communicate with us via divination. They show themselves to us, adults and children. Today, the exact same divinities from ancient Kemet we still deal with to this very day. They have the same um, descriptive titles in the languages of Afuraka, Afurakai today, that they carry in ancient Kemet the same name, same deity, same functions, and so forth. When you have individuals, whether they're talking about Kemet Ik, spirituality, which is a misnomer, it will be, if they wanted to use it properly, be Kemeti, spirituality based on the language itself. Ik is a, you know, a, a European linguistic device, a suffix in European languages that has nothing to do with, with 
the language of ancient Kemet. So um, spirituality, if they talk about Kemeti or Kemetic spirituality, and they're talking about, for example, Amen and Ra and Pata and Kepra are all forms of the same deity, totally inaccurate. Amen, Ra, Pata, Kepra, Hatem, totally different deities with their own function in creation. However, individuals have been teaching that Amen or Amen Ra is the God and Pata is just a form, then now you understand when you look at the texts themselves and study and practice, engage the practice of the ancestral religion yourself and actually deal with and interface with these different abosom, these different divinities, now you can see that these individuals who are calling themselves priests and priestesses and so forth were never really dealing with these divinities because otherwise they would know immediately that not only is there Amen, but there's also Amenet, and we can communicate with them. So first of all, they would know that they both exist. They are both two halves of a whole. They're actual entities, and they actually do communicate with the people. Then they would actually know that Atem is a divinity that possesses, that communicates, and so forth. They would know who they are in other traditions. They would know that Ra and Ra'et exist. It's not just Ra. It's also Ra'et. She's just as important as Ra. They would communicate with them. They would know who they are. They wouldn't conflate Ra with Amen. They wouldn't conflate Ra'et with, or, or Amenet saying that they're the same entity. Yes, Amen sometimes is called Amen Ra, just like you will take on the name of, you know, an uncle. Your middle name may be the name of an uncle. That doesn't mean that you and your uncle are the same person and your not, uncle never existed and you, you were always one. That's, that's nonsense. You're talking about a title, a praise name, an umrane that talks about a certain characteristic. So, yes, sometimes amen is called amen ra. Sometimes amenet is called amenet ra'et. But that doesn't take away from the fact that ra and ra'et are two separate and distinct divinities from not only one another, but also from amen and amenet. And they're actually the grandchildren of, of amen and amenet. The mother of ra and ra'et are nun and nunet. And that's clearly established in the text. And we show that also in the Okra, Okra Complex, the soul of our Kanfo. We also show that in our article in Yonkon Pong, in Yonkon Tong, Ra and Riot, and other articles as well. And that, those are all on the website, free download. So you have individuals who are talking about ancient culture from Kemet, but they're missing this reality. And they've been teaching this for years. Um, you want to look and see what people have been teaching for a number of years before they switch up and say, well, we've been teaching this all along. Because most of them, some of the information that they've been teaching or a great deal of it is somewhere out on the net or somewhere um, with the people who they've been connected with and you can connect with other individuals to see what have these individuals been teaching. Is what they're teaching now the same as what they were teaching before and why did it change? Why is it that you didn't know Aminet existed before as a real entity and you had nothing to do with her and all of a sudden, after 10, 15, 20 years, you're throwing her name around as if you've known about her all along? And if you were not, what were you doing? Why were you imbalanced the whole time? Same thing with Ra and Ra'et. The same is true of Ma'at, the female divinity of divine law and balance, who we invoke and her force, when it anima operates through us, animates a certain aspect of our spirit, helps us to realign with the law and balance. But then her counterpart is the Abosom of divinity, Ma'a, the male divinity of law and balance. And his force, when you invoke him, will help you to reestablish balance in your life and see what the law actually is as it applies to a certain situation or individual or entity that you're engaged with or interfacing with. Ma'a and Ma'at are male and female forces, Abosom, Orisha, and so forth. When you hear people talk about Ma'at all day long, and they have shrines, they have entire organizations using Ma'at as part of the name, 
priesthoods, priestesshoods, high priests, high priestesses, chiefs, kings, all kinds of things dealing with Ma'at. But they never mention the deity Ma'at once. Don't even know he exists. He's just as real, just as important as Ma'at. Then that betrays the fact that they were never really dealing with Ma'at in the first place, not as a divinity, maybe as an idea, and they liked the fact that Ma'at had to do with law, had to do with balance and so forth, but if they had actually invoked Ma'at, she would have directed them to invoke Ma'at as well, and he would have come forth and shown them who he actually is. Some, in some um, circumstances, the Abosom would show themselves or make them, themselves you know, their presence felt, and the individuals were just rejected because the whites and offspring didn't teach them about Ma'a, so they just reject any notion of that. Even if you bring it up to them, some individual, they will say, no, well, that's not true because it's only Ma'a. Where did they get that idea? If, as we showed in previous broadcasts, you can look simply in the Shat and Dua, the book of what is in the spirit realm of the Dua, the so-called underworld, in the 11th hour of the night, there's an image of the deity, the male divinity, Ma'a. He's standing there, and then his name is spelled right next to him in the Medutu in the hieroglyphics Ma'a. And that's, that's one instance, and then there are instances in the Meru text of the divinity Ma'a as well. So why haven't they been able to communicate with that divinity or find him in the different traditions that they practice? Because when you're infected with the misinformation of the whites and their offspring, then you will reject communications coming directly from your Samanfo, reject communications coming directly from the Abosom, and instead embrace only what the whites and their offspring have infected you with. We have that not only for people who are engaged in what they are calling comedic spirituality and so forth, but even the in the Akan tradition, for example, they will say that, number one, there's Inyame. They don't know that Inyame is just Oniyame, a title of Amen in ancient Kemet. It is not limited to the Akan people, of course. Inyame is called Inyambe in the Lhotse tradition. You'll find Inyambe, Injambe, Inzambi, for example, in the Bakango tradition. From East Akuraka, Akuraikai, through Central all the way west and to south of Furakafraikai, you'll find variations of the great father named Inyame, Injambe, Zambe, Jambe, Yambe, Zambe, various variations across the board. So you'll find Akan people trying to misdefine the name, the etymology of the name Inyame, and say it just means sparkling, which is inaccurate, nonsense. It's actually Ani. Amen, on the Amen, a title of Amen in ancient Kemet. So they don't understand that because they weren't really communicating with Nyame in the first place. And some of them will even say that, you know, Nyame is too busy and too aloof and too far to communicate with us, so we must communicate with, you know, with Nyame through the agency of the Yabosom, which is not accurate. Of course, we communicate with the Yabosom, but we communicate directly with Nyame and Nyame Wa via our cra on a consistent and daily basis, consciously and directly. So they don't understand that because they've received an infected culture. They won't even mention the reality that Nyamewa is actually the title of Aniyame, Aniyamenat, or Amenat, Amenet, Amenat from ancient Kemet. It's Nyamewa and Akan. The whites and their offspring say, that Inyamewa just is a title of a lesser female de deity, like female abosom, female forces in nature. They're called Inyamewa, and that's just a diminutive form of the name Inyame. So they'll say Inyame is the great father, the supreme being. He's mother and father, and Inyamewa just means lesser deity. Totally inaccurate but they're repeating the nonsense of the white and offspring and those infected elders and elderses or older people on the continent. Um, Inyame and Inyamewa, we show clearly, not only etymologically, it's Amen and Amenet, but we actually show their images in ancient Kanit, Nubia, ancient Kemet, right there. 
Then you have people saying that Nyon Compon and Nyon Conton were actually Ra and Rayet. Of course, we proved that in our publication. They'll say that Nyon Compon is just a title of Nyame. Then they'll say Oboade or Odomankoma. These are just titles of Nyame. They're conflating all of these different actual deities. They're forcing them to be one, all just simply titles of the great supreme being because they're trying to force the idiocy of monotheism into our culture. It's never been true. The Yoruba people do the same thing with the Lodumare, Edumare, and so forth, trying to force that to just be a title of Olorun, which is not accurate. Odumare or Edumare or Olodumare and Oshumare. Odumare and Oshumare or Edumare and Eshumare are Ra and Rayat in reality just like Da and Aida Huedo and Vodun, who are servants of Mawu and Lisa, the great mother and the great father. Edumare, Eshumare, or Odumare, Oshumare, or Ra and Ra, the creator and creatress, who are servants of Olorun and Olokun. You'll find certain texts, older texts, older um, renditions of texts, where they talk about Olorun and Olokun being the male and female divinity at the beginning of the world, before anything else was created. Later on, you have variations of Olokun being male, Olokun being, you know, married to um, Orumila, um, Olokun being a minor divinity and so forth. But you have older versions of the creation account of the Yoruba people, where they talk about Olorun and Olokun being the great father and the great mother pre-creation, the same as Amen and Amenet. Odumare or Olodumare and Oshumare are really Ra and Rayat, the creator and creatress. And in our article about Ra and Rayat and Yonkonpon and Yonkonpon, we address that reality. The creator and creatress is typically shown all across the continent as the rainbow serpent, the serpent swallowing its tail, the creative power, representing the collective ancestry of all Afurakani, Afurakaiti people, operating through the sun, using the sun as a transmitter of its spiritual power and creative force. You can find that in the Yonkonpon and the Yonkonton associated, associated with the um, circular serpent, the rainbow, the creative power, collective ancestry. You'll find that with Odumare and Oshumare, the rainbow serpent and so forth, swallowing its tail, collective ancestry and so forth. You'll find that with Da and Aida Huedo and Vodun, very explicitly, the rainbow serpent, collective ancestry of all Afurakani, Afurakani people, using the sun as a transmitter of spiritual power, creative power, creator and great trust, and so forth. So all these different major creative divinities are subordinate to Amen, Amenet, and Inyamewa, Inyame, um, Inyame, Inyamewa, Inakan. So you'll find that just like in ancient Kemet, you'll find that in the Akan tradition, people try to conflate actual deities all rolled up into one and make them one. When people purport to be engaged in Kemetic spirituality, Kemetic spirituality, they conflate these spirits like slaves into one because their white Arab masters, white European masters, force them mentally to engage that process whenever they interface or come in front or confront actual divinity. The same is done in numerous traditions across the continent. So you'll find people trying to identify themselves with Islam, Hebrewism, Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Taoism, Buddhism, and trying to force real cosmology to fit into these pseudo, um, non-spiritual pseudo-cosmology. So that's, that's the key. And when you now when you move forward to study and embrace the culture, you'll understand that. Okay, so I um, want to check the chat room right quick, make sure we didn't miss anything else. Okay. Um, so an Apurakani male friend of mine, father told me of a time when my friend was just 12 years old and playing at a recreation center, Afuraka Afurakai, 
drums and something came over him and he started playing like he never played before for about an hour. Could this 12-year-old have been possessed because his father says that he clearly didn't know how to play that well? Yes, that can happen. It could be a spirit of possession, a form of um, a comb, or it could be a form of uncomb, which is a spiritual communication or um, influence or motivation or direction. Um, but either way, that that happens, that's not uncommon at all. Just like somebody can go to a, you know, some people say, well, I'm not into ancestral religion, I'm not into that African stuff or whatever. I'll go to a ritual just to see what you all are doing, but I'm not into that stuff. Then they go to a ritual and they end up getting possessed. And it's very often by one of their own ancestresses and ancestors, but still that, that happens whether they, you know, expected it or not. They're still connected to the forces in nature. They're still connected to their insomnful. Um, if it's normal, it's a, you know, if they're connected to their own people, then that can happen. But then some people are very open just like we were talking about, some people open themselves, compromise their immunity physically because they're doing, you know, alcohol, drugs, or something like that, or just wearing their body down, not taking care of themselves, and they open themselves up to viral infection. Spiritually, you can open yourself up to spiritually viral um, entities. So sometimes if you go to a, a place where those kinds of entities are and you're open, then you can get connected to those as well. So you need to, of course, Protect yourself first and foremost the same way you would protect your physical body. If you're going to protect your physical body, your immunity, you do what you're supposed to do for your physical body in order to keep your immunity strong. It's the same thing with your spiritual immunity. You do what you need to do to keep yourself spiritually vibrant. That not only means also taking care of your physical body because of um, breakdown in your physical body can lead to a weakening of your spiritual immunity as well. So you still take care of your spiritual, your physical body, but you also harmonize your thoughts, intentions, and actions with order. So that includes ritual practices. Ritual that includes libation, communicating with your insomnia, communicating with your crop, communicating with your abosom, and so forth. Abo and quite different things. All right. Okay, so we um we're gonna leave it here. Now it's about eleven twenty-two. Um, again tomorrow, Egua Marketplace. Um, we have Enna Injideka Carmo, Fawa Hodie Suya, Pan African Educational Online Co-op classes, which they will beginning be beginning September twenty-first. Um, she's going to give you all the information. We're going to talk about their educational institution, their online educational institution. They have a number of Mwalimu instructors um, teaching a number of different subjects that are vital to our development and the nation-building process and our liberation, of course. So please tune in for that tomorrow and see how you can get involved in the Pan-African Online Educational Co-op classes with Fawa Hodie Suya with, with and uh, Inji Deka Carmo, um, 9 p.m. Eastern tomorrow on Blog Talk here. Um, Philadelphia, we will be in Philadelphia this minute uh, this Saturday, 1 p.m., our Black Comeback Center. We will be giving away free books to everyone who comes or attends. The event is free. Um, we'll be giving away one of our free, one of our books for free, soft cover book. For those who would like to support our endeavors, you can um, go to our publications page on our website, O-D-W-I-R-A-S is in free, o dot com. We have 10 books in soft cover. Um, they only range between 8 and $11 um, covering a vest. Of course, the information we talked about tonight was uh, a number of different um, areas, subject areas, dealing with Afurakani, Afurakani, ancestral religion, culture, and Ama ancestral nation building. Um, and this is the way that we are able to do the free book giveaways as well, as well as get the information out. And for those of our people who are unemployed or need to generate additional income, we also have the piece on the website, on the publications page of the website, where you can purchase the books wholesale and you can sell them retail 
and generate additional income for yourself while also getting this information out to people in your area that we may otherwise uh, not be, you know, privy to reaching at this particular time. So it's a, you know, it's a win-win situation. The community gets informed, but then you can also generate additional income for yourself. Um, we will be posting a um, additional link on that page. We um, we did have a, a little sale, so to speak, between last week, between Monday and Wednesday, um, where we had a 50% off sale for the books because we were trying to generate funds to print out more books for the free book giveaway. May I say for the people who ordered the 10 books, we basically had people ordering the, the 10 book set for 50% off. We're going to add a, a button on the website where you can order um, for those who purchase the entire 10 book set, it will be a discount. As it stands right now, one of our books is eight dollars. Three of them are nine dollars. Um, four of them are uh, ten dollars, and one of them is eleven. So altogether, if somebody wanted to purchase, and sometimes people will purchase the entire set. Um, for example, sometimes people who live out of the country may purchase the entire set just so. It saves on the shipping because, you know, the shipping is more when you ship out of the country. So they're like, well, I might as well get all 10 books now instead of paying extra for shipping to order, you know, five now and five later. Uh, but the same thing in the States. Sometimes people just want the entire set so they can share them with friends, family members, coworkers, and just study the information themselves. We print the books in our in-house on our own printers in color, so all the books are in color, of course. Um, Sometimes people want the entire set. The entire set, 10 books, is $96 for shipping. Um, we're going to have a, you know, a set price, a set discount price for those who purchase the entire 10 book set. It'll basically be 30% off of, of the $96. So it'll be, you know, um, basically somewhere around $67 or something like that plus shipping. So. Um, we're going to add that button, but if anybody wants to order the 10-book set, it'll basically be like $70, and that would include shipping. We're going to put that button on the website um, probably later tonight, so that'll be a, a new option for people who just want to, you know, get that going because some people want that, that information. They'll save on the shipping cost, have all of the books at the same time, and, you know, they can begin to share that information with friends and family members and so forth. And also for the people, it's similar for the people who would like to distribute as well. So we're going to put that up. We also have a process whereby if you want to support our work, of course right now we have 10 books in soft cover and we have some more coming out. So some people, you can make a donation on the same page. If you make a donation of $15 or more, we will send you one of our books anyway. Some people, if you can make Click the option in PayPal when you make the donation. It says make this donation recurrent, which means every month they would um, debit and send us that same amount. So if you made a $15 recurrent donation, then every month PayPal would send us $15 from you, and every month we would send you one of our books. So right now we have 10 books, so we have at least 10 straight months. You'll be getting a book in the mail every month on the same date. Um, but within the next few weeks, actually, we're going to have a couple more books out. So by the time that 10 months is up, we're going to have more books out. We'll probably have 20 books out by then because we have a few in waiting right now that we're putting together. And then there's a great deal of information that we have not had a chance to publish yet. So we will have many more books by the time that 10 months is up. So some people have done that. Yet I'll say we appreciate it. And it's just easier for them because they can just, you know, make a – recurrent donation. They don't have to think about it every month, but they get a book in the mail every month automatically. Um, so all of that can be done whether you're purchasing a 10-book set um, or, you know, you can send us an email um, or just if you want to just purchase one book or more or if you want to make a donation, we're going to send you a book anyway. All of that can be done on the on home page on the website, OG.co.com, O-D-W-I-R-A, F is in free, o.com slash nhoma, N-H-O-M-A, 
www.hdmlive.html. Or even if you just go to the um, front page of the website and scroll down past the introduction, you'll see a link to the Nhoma, the publications page, and all the information is there, including the links to the free ebook versions of all of our books. Because all of the books, of course, as we said earlier, all of the ebook versions of our books are free. And the soft cover versions that we print out ourselves, we have 10 of them out of the 15, and 10 of them are free as well. So, okay. So we have one more question, and then that'll be it. So, um, okay, Michio, number 8782, you had a question or a comment? Michio, what was your phone? It's uh, Sasha Shu. I mean, uh, uh, Jersey. Um, what's up? I two, well, one question and uh, one comment uh, to share uh, the comment first. Um, you recall the uh, Sankofa uh, Festival in Philadelphia uh, last month? Yeah. Right. All right. Just like from what you were talking about earlier and as far as monotheism and uh, polytheism, the um, oh, he's the chief. I believe of the uh, Philly um, group, he had gave I, I, you. I don't think you had got there yet, but he had gave like a little, you know, explanation as far as that, and it went just like what you were saying. In the opposite, though, you know, how, like you know, we recognize, you know, that it wasn't you know one entity, and from that one entity, you know, different expressions came out. That's Basically, what he had said, and I just sat there, and I was just like, "Huh?" And my mouth dropped, and I couldn't believe he said this. But everything else that was going on, I'm like, "Huh?" I just, that's just not figuring right, and everything else. Um, I just wanted to make that comment. Uh, it, it definitely is, uh, just as you said, even with people who have been in the culture for a long time, and you know, uh, you know, and are getting titles and everything else, they're still, you know, either Knowingly or unknowingly, still kind of spreading that. At the same time, though, I do kind of understand that because I think, uh, you know, with regards to the the atmosphere and the environment, it was an outside festival. Anybody could have walked up, you know, different things could have popped off or whatever else had he went another way, I guess. And it was next, right next to a church, too, which was kind of funny. Um, my question, though, is uh, I think I asked this the other night. Have you ever heard of the, uh, I think it's called the Momo Me Festival over in, um, I forgot what part of uh, Ghana that they have it, but I, from what I've read and uh, I've read into it, it's practiced in several different areas in, uh, in uh, uh, Ghana. Do you recall uh, anything on that? This, um... How do you spell it again? It's uh, M-O-M. Oh, hold on. Yeah. M-O-M-O-M-E. Momo Me Festival. And as far as from what I can understand, you know, I, I researched who, you know, who the author of it was to find out, you know, where where their mindset was and their politics was, see if it was, you know, information to be trusted or not. But, they basically were saying that it was a ceremony, it was like a cleansing ceremony. Um, you know, every once in a while uh, they would do it, and it started back in like 1700, 1800, <clears throat> excuse me, whenever the communities felt like they were being approached upon, you know, by something, whether it was disease or whether it was, uh, you know, actual physical enemies or whatever else like that. And they would do this ceremony or this festival, have the, uh, the uh, ritual, and then they would um, basically they switch roles. Um, uh, gender roles, and, and as far as imitation only, not anything else, just just imitation. So the women would walk around, and instead of having real guns, they would have sticks, and then they would sit, you know, upon the rocks and, you know, conversate in a circle like the men did, uh, typically in village life. Okay, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with it. Um, I would have to check it out because... Um but I've seen um, they've mentioned it being connected with the Sepwi people. Sepwi people are in uh, basically okay. Sepwi is like northwest, um, northwest Ghana, 
especially in the ancient Akan Empire. Um, and we mentioned the Sekwe okay. people um, on the Apo page on our website. There was some mm-hmm. mixture with other groups um, in the Sefwi region and then into going into Ivory Coast. For example, okay. um, the Akan people celebrate Apo, like the Akan people of Wenchi and Bono, when they migrated over into the Sefwi region, they continued to celebrate Apo, and they're, the Asona people in the Sefwi region still celebrate Apo um, around March or April. Um, but then they call it Alie in that region because there's a linguistic, you know, that they've connected with some of the Sefwi people and there's some interaction, some cultural exchange. So I would like to see um, if the Momo Mi festival is like an Akan festival or if it was like an Enzima or a Sefwi um, festival and it was just adopted or see what, what it was, so I'd have to look into it. But maybe I'll say for pointing that out. That's something I'll check out, definitely. Yeah, I, I can see what um, the uh, email that to you. I can email you um, the art, one of the articles I got on it. Because the way um, you described it, it kind of sounded almost like the, um, sound like a version of the Apo Festival. Um, so I'd like to see if it's, if it's the same thing and they just give it a different name in a different region. Right. Or, you know, See what, what, what it may be, what but it really is. The so. Sefri, that sounded familiar from the article. Right. It's like S E S E something. S E F W or something like that. So, yeah, I, right, I, I, right. Um, I, can, I can send you that. Uh, I, I can send you that uh, actually in a little bit. Okay. I appreciate it. And I, and I know, like, no, when you asked problem, about no. the San Kofa Festival, um, there were different people there. So, there were. There were some Ghanaians that were at the festival. Um, right. Then there were others who were from here. Uh, so I don't know exactly who was speaking at the time, but I know one thing I do know is it that was the chief. like some of the Ghanaians, they you know they they were involved in their culture and stuff like that. All of them are not you know a hundred percent necessarily involved in ancestral religious culture and practices. I, I, you may have heard some of them mention something um, Christian type language. Um, yeah. <laughs> when they were speaking, so all of them yeah. weren't, you know, on that yet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. And it was the yeah. same thing. With people who were at the event, but then I know the people who organized the event. They're embracing ancestral culture from the, you know, um, real sense, and they're incorporating. You know, what what we like when we talk about Amen, Amenet, Nyamewa, Nyame, Mawu and Lisa, the balance of male and female, the reason why people start resonating with that because inside their cries been telling that all along. So once it's right. vocalized to people, um, they say, Wait a minute, that's that's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I know the people who organize the event, they're moving in that direction as well. They they realize that's the real information. They see, they've been able to verify that, so I know they're moving in that direction. Oh. True, true. That, that's why when I, when, I, when, I, um, when I came up there, uh, you know, when we had the, the part where everybody comes up and greet, and I came up there, that's why I looked at you the way I did. I'm like, man, I still want to, want to tell you something. I was like, ah, I'll wait. <laughs> oh, okay. I, just, I, I was just looking at the whole, you know, the whole event, because we had got there. I think like oh gosh, we got there about uh, probably like tw- I think it started at twelve. We got there probably about one or something, and we was just you know we were sitting out there, and, you know we walked the block and everything else like that, you know back and forth, and you know we visited the vendors and everything else that they had going on out there, and then when they started the uh, you know the whole uh, the ceremonies and everything else, uh, they came out there, they poured libation and everything else, and they went we went into uh, explanation. You know of the uh, Hubble storm, and I was just like, huh? And um, my nephew, who I usually he usually goes with me to the various different events, or whatever else, uh, he started saying that, and I'm, you know, I tell him, you know, all the stuff that I'm learning or whatever else, and he kind of looked over at me. And he's like, huh? I was like, just hold on, <laughs> we'll figure it out later. I can't do nothing about that right now. Oh, another thing too. Um, 
just just an idea. I don't know if you'd be able to uh, if if you and uh, you know um, you know brother uh, Baruti. I uh, I know you talking about Mwalimu Baruti. Yes. Yes. Yeah, okay, I heard I, him. Now we give you some. Yeah. Well, we haven't met, but I know you talk. Right. Okay. He he gave you some huge huge props on a show. Um, I don't remember which one it was. Oh gosh, I, I think it was from 2000, uh, 2012, 2013. I think he was on a show with um, uh, War on the Horizon um, with uh, was it with Angela Freeman? I think she was moderating the show that night. I believe it's on uh, I believe it's on YouTube. Uh, I, I'll send that one to you too when, uh, once I find it again. But uh, what I was going to say was um, for the uh, the Ball show. Uh, that would be a good idea to have him on there. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, we appreciate the work that uh, Baba Baruti has been doing over the years. He's one of the, you know, solid, consistent um, individuals who's mm-hmm. promoting, you know, nation building, clear, focused, no nonsense, and just you know putting it out there year after year and giving people a you know a foundation to. Stand upon. So, yeah, that's something we want to connect with. And I'm trying to connect. I know they have an event. Um, I saw that he was having an event somewhere. It might be New York um, coming up soon. So people should check that, that out as well. Is that the one with Professor Griff, I think? And, uh, is that the one with Professor Griff and uh, Zaza Ali? Uh, it might be Irritated Genie and him. Yeah, yeah. Irritated Genie is definitely part. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. Yep. It is New York. You're right. Okay, so I saw that. So people, you know, check that out because mm-hmm. I, I believe it, it's either in September. I think it's this month. Coming up this month. I think it's in the latter part of this month. Um, okay. So definitely you check out, everybody can check out Mwalimu Baruti, B A R U T I. He has a number of publications out dealing with African consciousness and just a number of different subjects, but great information, solid individual, and I know they're doing an event. If you look on Facebook, it's posting a number of different places on Facebook, and then they have the com website. He has his own publishing company. He publishes his own books, so you can go there as well. They have a homeschooling and everything as well in Atlanta, so um, we're in the Atlanta area, so uh, definitely check that out. Indeed, 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 indeed. Oh, also, um, I know you got a. Uh, I just saw it not too long ago. You got your Twitter. You got your um, uh, Google Plus. Did you get a uh, Instagram yet? Um, that's gonna be next because somebody else asked me about that, and I hadn't been. <laughs> I had never used really yeah. been on it much, but I, that's something I wanna um. Just utilize to get the word out, get some of those images out there, and, and so people can see, it, especially even the images here with Amen, Amenet, mm-hmm. the different divinities, so people can actually see them and be reminded of the fact right. that these are real divinities, um, so it can resonate with them. So yeah, we're gonna get up, we're gonna put that together as well. Okay, okay, because we're up, you know, I'm going there. Uh, well, not right at the moment, but I'm typically throwing out the uh, information um, from. Uh, from the books, um, the um, crew, uh, broadcast you did and everything else. And, you know, initially it was funny because when I first started sending stuff out, I wouldn't get no kind of reply or whatever else. But now it's like, you know, you're getting, it's getting some feedback from it. So it is working. It's a slow okay. trickle, but it works. It start, you know, starting to build up and people are asking about the show and, you know, everything else. And initially a couple of people thought it was me who was doing the show. I'm like, ah, that ain't me. <laughs> That's uh, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's, zero four. that's not me at all. Trust me. We got two <laughs> two different people here. That's his work. I'm just sharing it. That that you know, all credit goes to him. But uh, yeah, you, you you building a following there is just you know, you know when you get on there, then I can go ahead and be able to tag you in there and attribute everything I do, so they can come back to your uh, to your uh, your um, your page there. Cause there's a lot a lot of craziness that goes on there as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, yeah, no, man, I'll say we appreciate 
Appreciate you um, no sending the word out and spreading that information. And made I say for um, reminding us because, yeah, somebody else asked me about that not too long ago. I said, yes, I'm going to add the Instagram piece there, and I hadn't done it yet, but you just reminded me to get back on there and uh, put it out. So we'll probably do that this week as well. Okay, okay. So then uh, you'll be out here Saturday, right? Right, Saturday at 1 p.m. on 25th in York. Okay, yeah, because I just, I just talked to uh, Baba Shango uh, a few weeks ago. I went over there and uh, stopped by the uh, shop he's up there, selling the water ice and everything else. You know you know how he do. Stay busy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I was over oh. there chopping it up with him uh, a few weeks ago. So he, he, he can't wait for you to come out there either. Oh, no, I'm looking forward to it. We're getting back, you know, get a chance to get some of this. Um, we haven't been... Back, I mean, we did the Sankofa Festival, uh, Afashe, on August 9th. That was more like a, you know, just a, just a short uh, presentation, less than 30 minutes to the community. They yeah, had yeah. the vendors out and everything. And just people were coming out just learning some basic stuff about culture. But this is going to be, we haven't done a presentation, like a full presentation in Philly since December uh, 7th. So since then. Okay, yeah. Um, when we did that presentation, we only had two of our books in soft cover at that point. So now this time we come out, we're going to have all ten. Um, so yeah, we're looking forward to you know sharing this information, the stuff that we've released since then with the community. So it's going to be a good good piece. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, it will be. I'll be uh, throwing out some more stuff on the uh, networks for that one, trying to build up some more interest in there. Okay, made off We appreciate that. Yeah, that's nice, it. Okay, heads up. We talk to you. Uh, hold that. Hold that. And there's one more call, and then this will be the last call. Um, three one three nine, Michiwo. You had a question or a comment? Yes, yes. Real quick, real quick. Um. Oh man, I've learned so much tonight. I needed to to hear this show. Um, the children and shrines. Um, when you have, I have I have two fourteen year olds. I have an eighteen year old. I have a, a, a seven year old. Uh, when it comes to the shrine, do we do that as a family? Uh, do we do it in uh, set up in separate rooms or, um, you know, is it a, a family? I mean, how do we do that as a family? Because I mean, we haven't set up anything yet. Yeah, yeah, for for your um children that would be the family thing. And of course, um you set up an ancestral shrine and they can come to, you know, go through the shrine with you. Um you know, when you go now you, of course you can go yourself, you know, when you're by yourself as well. Um but at the same time, you know, on certain maybe you you set aside a certain day um on a periodic basis depending on what you feel drawn by your Instagram for the set aside, say if it was every other Saturday or every other Sunday or something like that, um, depending on what schedule you establish with them. And then the children can come with you. Now, the older children, they can also see you um, go to the shrine periodically and engage in susu hall, which is just a term in our con for meditation, which is, um, but su, or susu means to reflect and at home means self, to, so to reflect on the self is meditation, but you're still, it's really communication with the unsamafo and so forth. So some of the older children, they'll see you go and engage that process, and they may want to do that as well at some point on their own um, as they're beginning to learn, you know, incrementally. But at first, it would be, yes, you go with your family. The only time the Family members would have a separate ancestral shrine. It's like when your children move out the house, they have their own apartment. Then they would set, set up an ancestral shrine, you know, themselves. But as long as they're in your house, then they would go to yours, of course. Mm-hmm. Awesome, awesome, beautiful. And and, and one more thing. Um, about the lunar, um, I don't even want to call them Sabbaths anymore, um, lunar uh, rest days, um, is it, is that in the uh, the Akan culture, keeping the the lunar rest days? 
You mean in the sense of um, like Saturday on Sabbath, that kind of thing, or? Um, like, well, according to the, the, the lunar Sabbath, I mean the lunar phases, um, not per se like a Saturday or a Sunday, but just going by the lunar. Is that into our kind of culture? Specifically um, lunar. So there are, it's not as, as um, prominent, even though there's, you know, for the full moon and the uh, new moon, um, mm-hmm. sometimes people will engage in certain ritual practices, and it kind of varies um, from group to group, but it's not, like, dominant. Like, you mentioned, gotcha. like, some people will say a prayer to the spirit that animates the moon on the new moon as well as the full moon. But the key for us is <clears throat> every day of the week, you know, on Jordan, which is Monday, which is moon day, that is the day of the Abosom Ajua and our Joe. So we include these different Abosom in our libations and everything. Um, sometimes you'll be drawn to do specific things on specific days, and you'll notice the way the Abosom manifests, like on Wednesdays, Awukuda, you notice certain things dealing with Anansi or Akua on Mondays, Joada, you'll notice certain things happening with regard to the Abosom of the moon and certain things happening in your life that coincide with that on those mm-hmm. specific days, it, you know, for people who are Akan. So um, things happen like mm-hmm. that, but it's not as rigid as, say, for example, some people, they do every 7, 14, 21, 28, like that. Right, it's that's what I thought, too, like that the way. count, you know, yeah, okay. But we do take note mm-hmm. of the, you know, lunar phases. Um, there are, you know, differences in energy that happens. Like, like of course, you know, um, people will notate the fact that people, there are more crimes and stuff like that and happen, happening during the full moon. It, the full moon has an effect on the earth, affects the tides, the rising of the tides of the earth, of course, because of the mag- magnetism of the moon making the tides rise. Our bodies are over 70% water, so it makes our tides rise as well. So when we breathe in, we take in more moisture, and we hold in more moisture during that time. When we drink water and eat, we retain a little bit more moisture than normal, so our tides rise in our bodies. We have more water, so we behave differently when we have more water than we do when we're more fired up and dried out. So, you know, depending on how you handle yourself, if you have more water, you're cooler, you're more introspective, internalized, contemplative, and things like that. But if you're out of harmony with order, you feel like you're swamped, buried, underwater, depressed, anxious, and everything else. So Mm -hmm. depending on how you handle the shift in energy, um, you know, that'll, that'll determine the way things go. So we do take notice of the different phases for those reasons. But the key as far as the Yaposom that governs that day, if you're not born on that day, but the Yaposom that governs the day, which is Ajua, Juada, um, Monday, um, different things happen on those days. The energy of the day colors that day and the things that happen on that day. So we do take notice of that. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, no problem. And may that stay for the call. Okay, so, you know, I'll say, everybody, we thank you for tuning in. We'll be back on, like we said, tomorrow at 9 p.m. Eastern for Egua Marketplace Day with N.I. Inji Deka Carmo of Pablo Hodie, Suya, Pan-African Educational Online Co-op Classes. Um, please tune in for that. And, again, you know, I'll say, we thank you, and we will meet again. That's right.